Birthplace, 83 Beale Street, will be celebrating the 96th birthday of John F. Kennedy this weekend with an open house from noon until 4 p.m. and neighborhood walking tours each day at 2.30 in the afternoon. Uh, other announcements of upcoming events from anybody? Then we're going to go to past events. <laughs> All right. Um, past oh, events. Wait, are, 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 uh, Do you have an upcoming? Well, um, Memorial Day. It is true. Memorial Day is going upcoming. to be. Um, yes, right. We're going to have actually a, a bigger Memorial Day it. than usual. Yeah, right. And we did hear that from Bill McGordy last week, but I want to emphasize it for people um, who are watching that. Yes. Um, we're going to actually have a little bit of a parade with our our older veterans participating, and um, there there will be the usual um, gatherings at the uh, cemeteries for the Revolutionary War and Civil War um, remembrances, and then uh, coming back here and, um, as I say, a little bit of a parade, and then um, gathering Selected the Banco Hall. will right. be speaking eloquently, I'm sure. Uh, here in front of Town Hall, along with some other uh, speakers. And, and I think uh, Selectman Goldstein will be reading the proclamation. Ah, oh, that's this, right. Uh, okay. He will be Mr. <clears throat> Whereas. Okay. okay, very good. good. All right. Thank you. Uh, other future announcements. Gee, and I really do feel uh, I forgot about <laughs> I didn't forget about it, but I didn't put it down. Other future uh, events anybody wants to mention? Then... Um, Past events. Uh, on Saturday, we had the open uh, the open space division and um, um, the Brookline Bikes people hosting the celebration at Amory Park. And oh, I that know was Sunday. Sunday, sorry, uh, there were several select persons in attendance. So That's true. Select I was, in, I was uh, in attendance there, and if I can uh, tell a little story, I was I, I was. Uh, against my own will, pressed into service there. I did not go there with the intention of making a pu public spectacle of myself. <laughs> and uh, when it was time to, to begin the, par the bicycle parade, I found myself at the, at the front of near, near where it was being organized, where, um, where um, uh, John was, was, uh, was Dempsey was getting, getting the, the act together. He noticed me there. And he realized he didn't have anyone to act as the leader uh -huh. to lead the people around the park and into the proper starting position. So uh, he immediately uh, called on me to do it. And I, and I got to tell you, I felt like John Wayne in a wagon train <laughs> movie. It was like, wagon ho, and it was, uh, it, I led, led the parade. As it turns out, uh, Selectman Banker was there watching with, with amusement, I believe. So. Well, I, I, was, uh, I was cheering you on, Ken, <coughs> as, you, as you led. And actually, what I, I, I do want to make a comment about something that I thought was um, really nice about the day. As, as you know, the main parade um, went from uh, Amory Park up to Cleveland Circle, back down to Audubon Circle, and back to uh, Amory. So it was um, a, a fairly long, there were a lot of young kids, a lot of... Uh, uh, older people. Uh, I think the the dean of, of that I saw there was former town meeting member Michael Robbins, who was oh, wow. uh, on his wow. bike. Um, but um, uh, what was I thought a very nice touch was before that large group left, they had a special group for the youngest kids that circled the block uh, where Amory Playground is a couple of times. So. Uh, they they really provided a, a much uh, uh, more manageable thing for the really young kids uh, to participate in the day, and uh, I I thought that was just a great idea. A lot and, of fun, uh, and 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 it was real safety. I was going to say, yeah. Uh, I got some stats, I and mean, there were 566 uh, participants and wow. registered participants. And there were probably and maybe some a others, few more. <laughs> maybe a few more who weren't registered. And there were uh, a hundred, uh, approximately a hundred uh, of those of those kids that Selectman Banka mentioned. And I've also got, I've been asked to pass along some some thank yous to some of the town employees who were who are critical in the organization. And those are uh, Lieutenant Phil Harrington and Officer Ronnie McNeil of the Police Department. I know Ronnie's there every year and uh, loves that event. Uh, Sergeant Mark Terhan, also of the uh, Bicycle Unit of the Patrol Division. Uh, and then uh, we should, uh, of course, recognize the Recreation Department who, who puts it all together and right. does a wonderful job of it. 
Um, also, the, some of the sponsors should be mentioned too. Uh, first, they had um, uh, free safety checks for, by Landry's Bicycles, East Coast Alpine Bicycle, Urban Adventure Tours, and Eastern Mountains Sports. So I had my bike checked out, <laughs> and I know a lot of other people did as well. And then we should also, of course, mention uh, Brookline Bank and Chobe Hoy Associates, who are the two uh, big, uh, big name sponsors of the event. And they have both of them have done those for the past six years. Looking forward to uh, the seventh time around on that one. It was a lot okay. of fun. Okay. Well, that's great. Good to hear that it was well attended and lots of cycling. Any comments? Yes. Slightman um, Wyshynski. I'll, I'll mention that uh, over the weekend I met with a group from the Griggs Park Neighborhood Association. Uh -huh. uh, we had a, uh, at the home of uh, Sandy Springgarn, uh, uh, Susan Donahue uh, uh, organized it. Uh, like to thank them both and uh, it was a good group and uh, it, just one one of many uh, strong neighborhood associations oh good other slightman daily yeah, I, ju I just want to let everyone know that our diversity committee we held our first meeting last wednesday evening which was uh it was a, just an introductory meeting but it was uh very it's going to be a very good group i think and um, we went over some possible topics and things that that i think i had mentioned uh, most of them at our meeting last week the night before so um just wanted to let you all know that that was launched segment like baker yeah uh two things um First, uh, last, uh, at last week's meeting, uh, Paul Sainer uh, from the Brookline Community Foundation was here and uh, made, the about understanding Brookline. made the announcement that the Understanding Brookline Forum uh, was going to happen, and it did happen. Uh, there was a full house, uh, actually standing room only, uh, at the back of the hall at uh, the Senior Center. Um, understanding Brookline is a report that was done by the uh, Brookline Community Foundation. Um, there's a, a booklet that uh, is available at 40 Webster Place, yes. which is their headquarters, but it's also available online uh, if you go to Brookline Community Foundation. Very um, interesting analysis of uh, census data uh, with the most recent census and changes in Brookline. And uh, really uh, quite, uh, quite a uh, an interesting and useful report for the uh, sort of policies that we have to look at uh, over the future. Uh, and a good panel a discussion. And yes, and there was there was a panel discussion that went into some of the issues in a little bit more detail, but uh, certainly not all of them. Uh, right. There there is a great deal in the report, and there's there's also uh, a um, an even more detailed report that was done by Linda Olson Pelkey. Um, I don't know if that is available online or not, but uh, it's it's one that we've seen mm -hmm. that was not in the, the the form of the publication that is now now out uh, on the street. And then the other issue, in addition to that, is today was DPW Day, and I don't know, Andy, whether uh, Commissioner Papasturgeon is here. Um, he, he will be before us shortly. Uh, maybe I'll I'll save uh, I'll save that for you. <coughs> Very good. Okay. Can I add just yes. one more? Uh, last Thursday, and by the way, uh, I also attended the um, Understanding Brookline event. Thought it, found it very informative and uh, great event. Uh, also uh, attended last Thursday night a uh, event that was co-sponsored by the Recreation Department, by the Country Club, and the Dexter School. Right. And this is in uh, preparation and in anticipation and as a build-up to the U.S. Amateur Golf Tournament, which is coming this August. Uh, they had an event up at the Dexter School where they invited Mark Frost, who was the author of the book, The Greatest Game Ever Played, that uh, retells the thrilling Francis We Met story, and also movie star Bill Paxton, who was mm. the director of the film version of that, and the, it was great. They had a book signing and a, and a uh, discussion with uh, Bill Paxton and Mark Frost. It was very informative. And I did get some face time with Bill Paxton, as a matter of fact. And, You're going to uh, be in the next movie. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm going to be. If they ever do Big Love again, I think. It's true. Right, right. Bill Paxton is, is uh, this month's Nicolas Cage for us. So. OK. Well, this morning, uh, Mr. Kleckner and I uh, were among a substantial delegation from Brookline at the annual meeting of the Commonwealth Compact. Sandra DeBow, uh, Alan Balsam, Dr. Lloyd Jeleno, and also uh, HR uh, Commissioners Rita McNally and Brooks Ames were there. 
Uh, we heard from Governor Patrick and others that achieving diversity goals takes time and perseverance. And I must say, I came away understanding that the Commonwealth Compact provides excellent resources that we can tap into for best practices and also to help us with our recruitment. Um, it was a great meeting, and I was very pleased that we were so well represented this morning. So uh, having said that, I will move on to public comment. I believe we have one person, Mr. Ames, signed up. Uh, it was good to see all of you uh, this morning, or Mel and, and, and Betsy, to see you at the Commonwealth Compact event. One of the things that struck me was uh, Governor Patrick was asked uh, if, there were, if he had any regrets or if there was anything he would do differently um, on the diversity front. And he said, my staff will tell you that I am an impatient governor. But he said, on diversity issues, I wish I had been more impatient. And I guess my message to the selectmen would be, please be more impatient on the diversity front. And I would make a last final pitch for Article 10. We have come a long way. The petitioners have come a long way. We have, based on Mel's good faith and Alan's good faith and Lloyd's good faith, we have adopted the Article 9 structure. Uh, we have, based on comments that Selectman Benka made, we have taken out that provision that was objectionable, that was interpreted as sort of cutting out human resources and the Human Resources Board from the policy making process. So we have really tried to reach out to your board uh, because uh, I agree with Governor Patrick that it really, the tone has to come from the top. And so that's that we've extended an, an olive branch, and I, and I just would, would, would hope that there'd be some, some give and take here. All right, moving on, the next item on the calendar is the uh, minutes from May 14th. Are there any corrections or additions I, to the minutes? I did uh, make a few uh, All right. little corrections, so we which can I have a send over. Well, then let's pass in your comments to Kate, and we can move to approve them as amended. So moved. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Benka? Aye. Selectman Goldstein? Aye. Selectman Wyshynski? Aye. Chair votes aye. Um, next item is a, a gift from the SIDA Foundation. Um, Mr. Kleckner, would you like to just give us a little comment about it? Sure. Well, we were um, uh, visited and by um, Merritt Hewitt, who is the manager of the SIDA Yoga Ashram of Boston, which is located in Brookline, along with um, his colleague on the board, Melvin... Miller, I believe. Who's the publisher of the Bay State Banner, just so that everybody knows who Mr. Miller is. And uh, whose, whose daughter actually attended uh, Brookline High School, so that, yep. that's interesting. And they, they've donated now, I believe this is the, the second year in a row, a $3,000 voluntary um, gift to the town, and it's uh, identified to be used as, as follows, uh, the Brookline General Fund for a third, the Police Department for a third, and the Fire Department for a third. So we're very uh, pleased with this generous donation. and recommend the board's acceptance. Okay, and I move that we accept the gift of $3,000 from the SIDA Foundation, allocated as described. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Chair votes aye. Uh, next item is the uh, contract that we held from last week, pedestrian and bicycle improvements. Mr. Ditto. Good evening. So, uh -oh. we, we have from you all of your proposed markings, I do believe. Yes, and it's quite extensive and quite tiny print. So, yeah. um, um, what I can do is give you a brief um, outline of what this project involves, and then if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Basically, this is two projects rolled into one. The first one is bicycle accommodations, and that's happening at six locations. And they are a Carlton Street from Longwood to um, Monfort Street. And they're Harvard Street from the Allison Town Line to School Street. 
and Washington Street from Town Line to Cypress Street. And then Cy Cy Cypress Street south of Boylston to Paul Pender Circle. Um, also, uh, we'll be putting um, bicycle lanes on Dudley Street, Park Street, and that completes the six locations. Those six locations will be funded with the traffic, uh, I mean with the um, uh, bicycle accommodations code codes. The second part of the project involves pedestrian safety improvements, and that's happening at five locations. And those locations are uh, crosswalks, new crosswalks and re wheelchair ramps at Essex and Montford Street, Carlton Street at Houston, uh, Carlton Street at Ivy Street, Col Colchester Street at Chapel Street, and then the new sidewalk on Houston Street. And that particular part of the project is funded from uh, the street rehabilitation funds. I might add that these pro, uh, all of these uh, projects have been uh, reviewed and approved and had a public hearing at the Transportation Board uh, within the past year. Uh, we anticipate if we get approval to move forward tonight that this will take probably two months to complete. So I'm looking towards the end of July, beginning of August to have this work done. All right. Questions for Mr. Ditto? Sekman Wyshynski? Um, one of the conditions of appropriation on the bike uh, items was that the bike markings be uh, M-U-T-C-D compliant. So are, are these M-U-T-C-D compliant? Yes. Okay. I, I also notice um, that you're taking out the crosswalk in front of the old Sewell School on Cypress Street, and I would uh, congratulate you uh, after all these years uh, on taking out that uh, crosswalk. Um, uh, it's it's no longer a school; it's in the middle of the street. Right. It's, uh, it doesn't serve any function at that location. Uh, right. Um, Second one, Daly. Yeah, no, I just wanted to say uh, we held this from last week. Um, just to get the, the map and, and so forth. And I have not heard from anyone in, in the meantime from last week to this week who has any objection to any of these. As Mr. Ditto explained, the, the Transportation Board um, has had public hearings on these issues. So I think we've met our obligations um, to uh, discuss these bicycle markings. I do have a question. Sure. Um, question. The, t the two items on here that I think are the, the most um, worrisome are the two bicycle lanes, one on Park Street, one on Dudley Street, and they're going against the flow of traffic, if I, if I recall. Is, is Park, I know Dudley Street is. Park Street, is that going wrong way for a while also? Yes. So c can you explain what kinds of markings there'll be to especially alert drivers that bicycles will be coming at them in the wrong way. Is there something that we can do to really highlight the fact that this is an unusual situation? Um, a couple of things we'll be doing to, to uh, achieve that goal. The first one is uh, on the pavement itself, it will be a double yellow center line with the cross hatching, and that, that will be about that wide approximately. Mm -hmm. And then at the beginning, and end, no, actually at the beginning there'll be a sign that says, where it says, do not enter, there'll be a sign except for bicycles. Um, that's mainly more for the bicyclists than they are for the um, vehicular drivers. But I think between the signage and the, particularly the, the pavement marking, it's going to delineate. Then they'll have the bicycle logo within that five-foot bicycle lane to yeah. also delineate it's a bike lane. Is it possible that a different color of marking than just white would be, would be? Yeah, the these will be yellow. These will be fluorescent yellow. So they'll look, they'll look different as a matter of color right. than the standard markings right. too, right? Even a third color. I mean, yellow you do see like double yellow lines and things. Would it be, would it be advisable to do a, a green color or something? Well, or? We do have counterflow. These are called counterflow lanes. We have 
two of those in place already that have been in place for I want to say two or three years. That's right. And that's on Netherlands Road and Parkway. And that's basically where they were striped and they seem to be working okay. I think that the, the um, uh, you know, if you're sort of talking about dusk or something, the white and the yellow are more visible right. in, in lower light conditions than for instance, screen. Would yeah, be. I'm worried about the Dudley Street one in particular. It's a long way and a, and a, and a real mm -hmm. departure. I think people aren't going to expect it. And and, and, uh, and I'm, I'm all for it, but I want to yeah. give us every opportunity to, 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 to mark it and mark it properly. Right. I mean, are, are you, th to Selectman uh, Goldstein's point, have you thought about, you know, watch for bicycles or something, you know, a, a, a a sign on a pole somewhere in that area. Um, we don't have any of those on. The only, what we did do, uh, particularly at Dudley Road where it bends around, uh, right. that's a very uh, touchy point. And what we did is we banned parking on the opposite side of the street where the bike lane is. So it gives, you know, the traffic a little more space to, you know, go out further away from the bike. Is it possible maybe? When, when it first opens, that we can put up, uh, you know, one of those temporary flashing signs. Yeah, we can put maybe some introductory signs, so to speak. Yeah. Let people be aware that this is something new and watch out for it. Good. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions before we take a vote? All right. Then I move that we award an ex execute contract number PW13-19. Pedestrian and bicycle improvements on various streets in the amount of $216,538.02 with Aqualine Utility of East Bridgewater, Mass. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ditto. Now we have a grant of locations. Um, NSTAR. Is this going to be Mr. Ditto again? Yep. Mm -hmm. The uh, NSTAR is petitioning the town to install underground conduit and manholes um, at the locations listed on the agenda. And the reason for this request is that they want to upgrade the underground structures and thereby improving the reliability of the electricity in the area. Um, the seven day notices were delivered to the, all the abutters. Uh, we haven't heard any response in the engineering division, but this is a public hearing. Right. So uh, we have a representative from NSTAR here to answer any questions. Well, let's first just say that it's Perry Street, Linden Square, Linden Place, and Toxteth Street. Um, this is a public hearing. Is there anyone present who wishes to speak either in favor or in opposition to this uh, grant of location for construction with NSTAR? Seeing and hearing none, members of the board, do you have questions? Yes, Selectman Daly. I do. I have a question for the, the lady from NSTAR. Hi, would you mind just identifying yourself, please? I'm Sheila Gillis. Um, so I noticed that the work is going to begin at 7 p.m. Is that right? That's what it says on our... Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's the hearing. Tonight. The hearing yeah. tonight. Okay. No, okay. never mind. <laughs> this is day work, is yeah. it? Yes. Right. Okay, fine. And I, well, I don't have any question at all. Then, then I have a question which is not related to this particularly, mm. but I did notice that there's a lot of uh, NSTAR work going on. So is there a sort of an overall um, upgrade happening? I noticed on St. Paul Street today that there were many NSTAR vehicles. Um, I know we've had ongoing um, project and to replace all of the old systems throughout. Mm -hmm. And um, I know particularly, I think they're finishing up now on Balker. Uh huh. Poker Street, Street. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? I think that work on St. Paul Street is National Grid. They're, oh, National they're Grid. Okay. They're gas main from right. uh, actually. Uh, I apologize. Street all the way down to. Uh, <laughs> okay. Apologize for the mistake. You get, get blamed for everything. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, okay. Um, then I believe we can move.
to approve or to grant permission to construct in a location for such a line of conduits and manholes with the necessary cables therein under the following public ways, and I'm not going to read this out, but Perry Street, um, Linden Place, Perry Street, Linden Square, Toxteth Street, and Perry Street. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Vinka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Okay, and now um, we have a reserve fund transfer from the DPW Commissioner. Waste management. Good evening. And uh, thank you for those that you, uh, th those of you who attended. Oh yes, our DPW now we want to hear about. Today. Yes, it's excellent. You uh, seem to have a bumper. Crop yeah, you of avoided youngsters. the rain, too. We did avoid the rain. It got a little cool in the afternoon, <laughs> but I want to report to the board that Selectman Beckin now, now knows all about our pipeline inspection camera and its inner workings. Absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, so he's an expert at that. We may have to use him in the field a couple of times. <laughs> Absolutely. To hone his skills. Absolutely. And I also know that Selectman Daly was there. Thank you for coming. Yes, that was uh, good. We I had, made the rounds. We had over 1,000 children there today. And we know this because we count the bags uh -huh. that we prepare. So we know exactly how many bags were prepared and how many we had left, and we had none left. Uh, so we had a lot of kids coming through there. All the third grade kids from Brookline Schools this morning came through by the bus load. Uh, and I got to tell you that, uh, that my staff and the folks that volunteer to, to work this day really have it down to a science now. It's a well-oiled machine. The buses roll in, the kids get off, the buses <laughs> move out to park and make room for the new buses, and the kids go on along their tours with their tour guides and come back, and the buses, the same bus that they came in on is waiting there for them to pick them up and take them on out of there. So it works really well. Well, uh, the, uh, the, when I was there, it was like early afternoon, and so I, our school children had already been and gone, and there was a, a whole uh, range of private school kids who had come, sure. and everyone seemed uh, thrilled with learning about the sewers and things like that. Yeah, <laughs> and climbing all over the climbing trucks and the, the front end and, and yeah. if you notice, I don't know, maybe you didn't notice, but we, we disconnect the horns now. Yes. Ah, <laughs> actually not, not true. Oh, you um, found one? Them apparently. <laughs> no, um, I, I spoke to some of your, your crews, and uh, apparently the air horns were disconnected, mm. but I can uh, guarantee that some of the horns were still working. Oh, okay. Well, uh, <laughs> not the air I, uh, I have direct <laughs> knowledge of that. But uh, what, what, while I was there, someone had made the inquiry, uh, do you do this all the time? Can we come up here, bring the kids, like, regularly? And they, they were, they were the, told uh, just once a, once a year. The, the, the DPW people who were there uh, were absolutely terrific uh, with the kids. I, I was there at the end of the day, at the end of a very long day uh, for, uh, for these men and women, and um, they really uh, were still really welcoming and enthusiastic and uh, just doing a great job. So we, yeah, I hope, they I should hope all you be will, commended and yes. thanked. I hope you will, uh, particularly Julie Piacentini, who, your assistant who worked so hard on this, but everybody uh, was yes. really put in a lot, of, a lot of extra time on it, and I yes, hope you will convey to them. I how, will, I will certainly will. Julie is our field general on this event, and uh, you know she cr really cracks a sharp whip up there. But I will tell you that uh, this is one day of the year that, that you know, we never get a shortage of volunteers for this assignment. Uh, they're always willing and eager to uh, participate, and, and they really get a boot out of watching the kids uh, and, uh, and showing them things that, uh, you know, are inspired. And a lot of things that the DPW does is not very awe-inspiring to people, but, but the kids really get a boot out of it. So we're going to keep doing it for as long as we can because uh, I think it's well worth doing for, for the community. I, I, I truly believe it's a wonderful community event, and I have to say I don't know how many communities there are that really encourage kids to come and crawl all over their very big equipment, um, which uh, kids get to see all the time, but they never really get to touch. And I just think it's wonderful. So, no, I, It's great. Great, when, great I, tradition. I was telling Thank Kevin you. Johnson that when my son was little and there, there was nothing like that, we used to go ha hang out at the, the firehouse. And, you know, if you were lucky, they'd let you climb up there for a minute and 
the kids. And uh, but it, it's it's not nearly as good as getting to try out lots of different pieces of equipment and learn all that sewer lore. <laughs> sewer lore. <laughs> well, we have a couple of we have a couple of exhibits that are really a hit for the kids every single year. One of them, of course, is the big sewer vac truck. Right. Uh, that uh, our boy JJ operates, and he does a terrific job with the kids. This year we got him a remote head, uh, uh, microphone that he could strap on, and, and he was in his glory showing the kids all about the sewer jet. Really, right. really oh, glamorous, great. sexy we'll, stuff. We'll, so. we'll have to consult with, with our, um, our colleague. Oh, come on now. Um, Mr. Green, what does what is it? He wears that green costume. We want to think oh, about. Yes, Mr. Yeah. Dempsey. Yes, Mr. Dempsey. Recycling man. Recycling yes, recycle man. man. Yes. Recycle man. We have yes. to think about the right kind of costume for this. The the what the Vactor, I think it's called. Yes. Um, was directly across from the engineering department with their transits, uh, with their transepts and their little wheels. And yeah. Surveying. And I, I will say the Vactor won hands <laughs> down. Uh, they, they, it was really difficult to, uh, uh, to attract attention uh, with transepts and wheels that you could roll around. So there actually was a discussion about how they could turn it into an obstacle course next year. Uh, I, I suggested. There, there are plans. There are plans I would be careful. I, I suggested <laughs> racing to them, you know, with the, yeah. the yeah. No, with the little wheels. Yeah, but. Yeah, they're they're gonna they're gonna work on it. Right. And, Good uh, creative and suggestions. And the pruning truck was also up and working, uh, which was a huge attraction. Um, this is. Uh, it's a lot of fun today. Yeah, it was. And thank you. All Thanks right, moving on to business. All right. Um, <laughs> reserve fund transfer. Oh, what the heck? Why don't we just approve this and go? It's okay with me. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me just tell you a little bit about it, just sure. so, so we, we can be clear. Uh, as you know, we have a, a, a five-year contract with waste management for the uh, collection and processing of single-stream recycling. This contract was awarded in October of 2010, uh, three years ago now almost. Uh, and I, I got to tell you that it's probably one of the big ex big, biggest successes that, that uh, I've experienced in terms of uh, solid waste management uh, going forward. You know, the, the, the tonnage in our municipal solid waste, uh, as we predicted, uh, has gone down considerably. We're now well below the 10,000 ton per year mark on municipal solid waste. And, uh, and, uh, the uh, corresponding uh, amount of uh, recycling tonnage has gone up, and we are now approaching 55 to 5,600 tons of recycling uh, each and every year, which has gone up uh, significantly since the advent of single stream. It uh, doesn't come without a cost, of course. We signed a five-year contract uh, that, that made, was made up of uh, an annual fee with escalators, of course, for the collection services. Uh, these are automated collection at curbside. Uh, it was also tied into a revenue sharing formula for, for uh, number six newspaper uh, based on the official board market uh, for number six news, we call it. Uh, and that uh, baseline was set at $40 per ton. The third component of the pricing is a fuel adjustment. Uh, as part of the original contract that we signed and negotiated with waste management, uh, because of the volatility in diesel fuel prices that allowed us a range of per gallon prices for diesel fuel, and that was between $2.35 and $2.95 per gallon. As long as the price for diesel fuel was within that range, uh, then we were held harmless. If the price climbed out of that range, which of course it has now, the, uh, the current price for diesel fuel is, is right around $4 uh, per gallon. Uh, then per our contract, we are required to pay the difference based on a fixed amount of gallons per month. Uh, and that, of course, is uh, it also adds escalator clauses to the contract. Since uh, September of 2012, the OBM, the official board market for number six paper, dropped from $40 a ton to $25 a ton. We have a $10 upset limit per ton. So if it, goes, if it drops more than uh, $10 a ton, we're held at the $10 level. So since September of 2012, uh, when it did drop to $25 a ton, we've been paying $10 per ton uh, for, the, for the additional cost for paper. Normally, in any given year, we would get a rebate on paper. If the price was in, in excess of $40 per ton, uh, we would get 60% of the difference back in terms of revenue sharing. 
Uh, as an example, last fiscal year, we, we took in about $40,000 in, in uh, revenue sharing uh, offsets for the paper market. The market has since risen back, risen back to $35 a ton, so we're, co we're coming back towards the $40 a ton, and I'm hopeful that in the next couple of months we'll be back at $40 a ton and the extra charges will stop. But because of these, these two additional fees, uh, for the first time that I can remember, we are now running a deficit in, in, uh, in recycling and solid waste overall. Even though the tonnage of municipal solid waste has dropped and we do save $87 a ton when that happens, it's not enough to cover the additional costs. We've incurred nearly $70,000 in additional costs for waste management because of the fuel charge and the paper processing. Uh, the lack of the rebate. We have enough money in the pr original purchase order uh, to cover uh, all but $42,000 of that $70,000 increase, hence the, uh, the reason for the uh, request for the reserve fund transfer. I'm before you tonight for two, two items. Number one is to get your approval uh, to, on the reserve fund transfer for $42,000 and to approve the transmittal of that to the advisory committee. And I will be leaving here to go directly to the advisory committee tonight for their approval. And then the second piece is your approval on extra work order number one for waste management for the same amount of money, which will then allow us to pay the final bills for this fiscal year and close out the account. Okay. Sounds pretty comprehensive description. Uh, are there questions for the commissioner? I do have a then, uh, in order to get Madam you, Chairman, sorry, I, I sorry, 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 Andy, thank you for that. It was comprehensive. What do we do to to verify the costs per ton for the recyclable paper and the and the fuel prices? Do we do we take waste management's word for it, no, or do we have our own system for no, it? No, we never take any, anybody's That's what I want to hear. So what, what, no, do, what, the, what do we do exactly? How do we track The paper price it? is based on the official board market, which is a, pu a federally published uh, index. Uh, that's used to determine the, the, the market price of the paper, so that's pretty standard. The diesel fuel prices are based on a six-month rolling average, and that's the federal government's index for, for diesel fuel pricing for the Northeast area. And it's only adjustable in six-month increments. So if it spikes monthly, we don't pay for that. But they take the, the rolling average over a six-month period. We use the federal government's numbers to determine that. Okay. And um, it's, it's who buy, we don't, they don't use our diesel fuel. Like, we've, we've, we've managed to negotiate some good de deals on diesel yes. fuel the town. I assume they're not filling up their, tr their trucks no, at our... they're responsible uh, to provide their own fuel. I mean, in the future, maybe there's some way we can we can get our favorable deals for for waste management and and try and control the cost of the diesel fuel. It, it, it's a consideration, but th their trucks are generally based in Avon. They're coming here every day from Avon. They're going back to Avon every day. And logistically speaking, you know, I'm not sure that we have the capacity to provide, you know, waste management trucks with diesel. Although, you know, it's something that we could consider if the price differential was, was that extreme. Yeah. I suppose we could consider that. Thanks. All right. Uh, I'm going to move two items at the same time. So it's two votes, but we're, we're going to vote them together. First, I move that we approve and transmit to the Advisory Committee the request from the DPW Commissioner for a reserve fund transfer in the amount of $42,000 uh, for end-of-year solid waste costs. Second, I move that we approve extra work order number one in the amount of $42,000 for work to be performed by waste management in connection with contract number PW10-12. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Binka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Chair votes aye. And Thank Commissioner, you. you now have sort of a happy sad. Yes, sad happy? <laughs> with mixed emotion that I talk to you about this next item. Uh, I've been working for the town of Brookline for a long time, uh, very long time, and one of the joys that I had, I, I was one of the youngest department heads, I think, in the history of the town to work at. I took over the water and sewer division at age 31, a uh, long time ago. But one of the pledges that I had uh, as director of water and sewer for the town was I was able to recognize talent uh, that was within the division uh, and try to encourage that talent 
uh, as time went on uh, and, and reward it through promotions and, and things of that nature. One of the most talented folks that we had in the division was, was Phil Trainer. Uh, he was originally the, uh, the uh, storekeeper in the water and sewer division. He's the one that ordered the supplies and took care of all the paperwork and, and the office functions. Uh, uh, as time went on, I, I grew to rely on him more and more because of his drive and ambition. And he was promoted to uh, inspector and general foreman and finally operations manager under my directorship. Uh, and I had the pleasure of recommending him to you uh, when I left uh, to take over as director of the Water and Sewer Division. And he's done a terrific job at that for the last uh, nearly four years. Uh, it's, uh, it's with sadness that I, that, that you know that he's, uh, he's put his papers in to retire at the end of June. Uh, and uh, I would had hoped that he would stay for as long as I would stay. Uh, it's always tough to fill senior management positions anywhere. Uh, but uh, I respect his decision, uh, and it's time for us to move on. So I'm here to talk to you about getting your approval to fill the soon-to-be vacant position of uh, Director of Water and Sewer. It's a, uh, it's a D6 classified uh, position in the senior management plan. Uh, this position is, is a key part of the senior management team at the Public Works Department. I do have four divisions with four division directors, and every one of them are like my right arm, so I have four right arms uh, to run the department. <laughs> this one is particularly critical. It's responsible for the operation of the water distribution system. Absolutely critical. It's responsible for the operation and maintenance of the sanitary storage system. Again, a critical operation. Also responsible for the operation and maintenance of the stormwater drainage system. Uh, and at nights like tonight, you see how critical that is. Uh, these posi this position has to be a, uh, the director must hold a grade four uh, water distribution certification from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which is the highest certification that you can obtain uh, for, to operate a, uh, a portable water, a drinking water system. Uh, so these are all important attributes that, that I have to be cognizant of going forward. We need your permission to fill the, fill the job tonight. We want to start the process. I'm, I'm, I'm anticipating it to be a very comprehensive process to fill this job uh, because it is a, a very critical position. Uh, we will be working with HR to develop a, uh, a position advertisement uh, that I would anticipate being advertised in all the normal places probably for three to four weeks. Uh, in addition to that, I would recommend the adver advertising in uh, the American Public Works Association journals uh, and newsletters and on their website, as well as the uh, New England Water Works Association professional journals in their website as well. We're looking for a well-rounded individual that has water and sewer operational experience that can hit the ground running, become part of our senior management team quickly, uh, and, and then move forward. Uh, I would, uh, after having conversations with the town administrator, I, I would recommend forming a, a screening committee of uh, perhaps uh, some internal folks and maybe one or two external folks to help us screen the applicants, review applications and re resumes, uh, and then perhaps shortlist uh, two or three or four candidates or, or five candidates for uh, for interviews uh, so that we can ultimately make a final recommendation to the town administrator and hence then to the uh, Board of Selectmen. So that's it in a nutshell. We, we, uh, it would be my hope to get the, uh, a, uh, a successful candidate on board sometime over the summer. Uh, certainly the, by the latest, uh, by Labor Day, I'd like to have somebody on board. Okay, I believe Mr. Kleckner, you had a Comment? Sure. Um, thank you, Andy. Andy and I have talked about this extensively, and uh, I, I look at this <clears throat> position. Oh, one clarification: with the, with the changes to the Town Administrator Act, um, it's actually will be my appointment, and the, the board will not. But I just like the controller position. We're going to pay very close attention, though. Well, <laughs> like the controller <laughs> position, which was a similar, not a department head level position, but a senior position. We did convene a screening panel. We invited a a member of the board to serve, and I'd be happy to do that as well here um, because we're, you know, one big big group here. But um, I, I totally support uh, Andy's uh, initiative, and uh, this will be a very comprehensive uh, 
uh, recruitment effort. Okay. Um, questions, comments from members of the board? Slightman Daly. Yes, uh, I, I want to say we'll, we will miss Mr. Trainer, and please give him our best. And don't get any ideas. <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep, Slightman Benka. Now, uh, Mr. Trainer actually was at DPW Day of today uh, as, as he came in the door, and uh, it was his last uh, DPW Day, um, but uh, he was uh, right out front uh, with the new camera. Yes. Um, how, how are you going to deal with the, the period uh, between Mr. Trainer's retirement and um, uh, the new person coming on board? I'm hoping that it won't be too long of a period, uh, but I have a very capable operations manager in water and sewer who is Phil's uh, number two man. Uh, he also has the required uh, certification to, to do his job. Uh, okay. You know, I will have to step in and perhaps fill the administrative void, uh, which is not a problem. But uh, I will rely on Tom Steele, who's the operations manager, to, to, to uh, provide continuity in the operations, the day-to-day -day operations. And he's perfectly capable of doing that. Great. Okay. But, you know, I would like, again, to make that time as short as possible. But I think it's important to have somebody at the helm. Well, we, we certainly would agree with you. But on the other hand, there's probably no one more capable than you to take over if, ne if necessary. So... <laughs> We, but I'm we, only we, one man. Right, right. We know that. We know that. You, 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 you should be given some relief. We understand. Um, okay, then I'm going to move that we approve. Whoops. Let me find my actual vote here. Um, authorize filling a vacancy in the position of director of water and sewer classification D6. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Chair votes aye. And I'm now going to um, move ahead on the agenda to item number Thank 14. You. Thank you, Commissioner. Sorry. <laughs> we, we have a, a crowd waiting in the back, I think. Chief, we're going to move your item forward. <laughs> and take up uh, police commendations. And I guess I would like to say, just in case there's someone here, I know we had some interest in one of our um, applications for common victualler. The uh, Cognac uh, Bistro application has been withdrawn. So if anyone's come for that, we're, we're, we, it's not on the calendar tonight. Chief. Sorry to keep everyone waiting. There's a couple more coming in. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, and thanks for... You, you said a couple more were coming. Yes, yes. <laughs> and thanks for shifting around the agenda. Uh, and I do apologize that we're running behind schedule. Um, I, I just... Uh, t tonight is, is a, uh, a real good night for the police department, I think, and for the town of Brookline, uh, based on the fact that we're going to honor uh, eight of our officers for the work that they've done throughout the year in 2012. Uh, when I talk a little bit about each one of them tonight, you'll hear... Um, one or two things that they did throughout the year, but don't be fooled by, by just doing that because they wouldn't be seated where they are and have been nominated for the awards that they've gotten without um, the quality of work and hard work that they've done throughout their careers. Tonight is a combination of, um, of a lot of hard work, a, a lot of new things, new thoughts um, that officers did to make Brookline a safer place. I think the proof at the end of the year when our crime rate was one of the lowest in a lot of years, uh, and it's continued thus far into 2013, where as of last week we were 25% uh, reduction in crime from the year before, which, which is fantastic. I, 
I just hope that we can keep it up and with the kind of work that you're going to hear about that these officers have done, um, I think that we'll be in a good place to do that. Um, we're going to, like I said, uh, give out awards to eight officers. The way we do it, and we've done it since uh, 2010, when Superintendent Morgan came up with a, um, with a method to do it, we were, we were not going to be, uh, have the awards be awarded from the top down. They're actually going to come from the ground up. And we've been doing that for the last three years and, and, and then some. But what we've done is we've asked the supervisors of the officers that do the work to nominate who they feel uh, has done some quality work because they're the closest to what gets done and then nominate them for, a, for a consideration for accommodation. And the accommodation gets reviewed up the chain of, uh, of command and finally to my desk and, and we make the decisions. At the end of uh, the year, that usually during the month of February of the following year, uh, a board is convened. The board is made up of every rank in the department, every division in the department, uh, and everybody ha has a vote. And they vote uh, officers for certain commendations for having met criteria and for different medals that we award. And you'll hear a couple of medals that were given out tonight. So that's what, what got us here tonight. And um, I know um, that you have a full agenda going on, and I, I would just like to move through the process and describe a little bit about what each officer has earned, introduce the officer to you and present them. Uh, Superintendent Morgan will present them with their uh, medal and corresponding uh, bar. So the first officer will be Sergeant Matt McDonald. Matt McDonald, uh, if you could stand up, Matt, um, will be awarded tonight a commendation bar with two stars. This two stars actually signifies that this officer has, um, has received 10 certificates of accommodation throughout his career with us for excellent police work. Uh, you met Matt McDonald within the last few months when you promoted him to sergeant, but he actually joined us in 2004 and he was promoted to sergeant in 2012, in November of 2012. The year 2012 was a really good year for him um, as he was awarded five certificates of accommodation. He was the officer that we had sent um, to Alabama to learn cyber crime, how to investigate computer crimes. Um, what he was able to bring back has really transformed the way we investigate crimes. I think put us at a pretty high bar. Uh, he's done a lot for us and uh, it's our pleasure to award him the accommodation bar with two stars. Second uh, with him, uh, Detective Carlos Crespo. Detective Crespo has been with us since uh, November of 2000. He was moved into the Detective Bureau in 2004. And uh, he, this year he has reached the, uh, the level of accommodation bar with one star, which signifies uh, 10, I, I think I made a mistake on, on uh, Matt, McDonald actually had 15 commendations. Detective Crespo has 10 commendations. So I'll correct that now. Um, he's done a lot of work throughout the year, throughout his career. And I do want to talk about one of them. Uh, back in March, up in the point area of the town, we had two individuals assaulted and robbed at knife point. Um, they, detectives took the case. They had absolutely no real thing to go on other than the fact that um, they had a, a cell phone that was taken that we had the possibility of tracing. They traced it to a location over in Everett, uh, narrowed it down to about 100 to 300 yard area. Uh, they mapped it out and they started knocking on doors. And lo and behold, they hit uh, somebody who gave them a direction to head. Uh, and they were able to get an apartment and interview three people. Based on those interviews and follow-up investigation, they were able to secure arrest warrants, uh, search warrants. Uh, three subjects were arrested, identified, arrested, and charged with the armed robbery up in uh, Cypress and Hot Street. A great job that they did overall, and we're very honored to give Carlos this uh, accommodation. <laughs> Next is a commendation bar with uh, commendation with, with one bar, and one bar signifies five commendations throughout his career, and this one goes to Patrol Officer Lloyd Davis. Uh, 
Lloyd has been with us since uh, 1984, and throughout his career with us, he has had many assignments in the patrol division, various shifts, uh, various assignments, and uh, right now you probably see him out with a little different uniform, riding a boat, bicycle in all kinds of weather, still doing what he loves best, and it's patrolling. Uh, back in uh, July of this year, of 2012, around 4.30 in the afternoon, uh, he was responding, he was on St. Paul Street coming down towards Parkland Street. He saw two men uh, knock a man to the ground, beat him up, and start to take uh, stuff from him. They were, actually, they were robbing him. Uh, when these two men set upon the one individual, he resisted uh, their, their uh, assault. Uh, with that, he, they ended up beating him up. Uh, Lloyd got out of the car, called it in, gave a great description of one subject that ran away, immediately placed a, a, the other subject under arrest there. Uh, responding officers located the second subject who had fled very quickly. Uh, he too was apprehended and both subjects were charged with armed robbery. Both subjects uh, had uh, a lot of drug violations uh, and he was able to take them into custody. Fortunately, the guy did not suffer that bad of a beating but had he not interrupted, it probably would have got a lot worse. So we're very honored to uh, recognize Patrol Officer Lloyd Davis tonight. <laughs> One more commendation uh, with a bar for five commendations. Uh, accommodation medal with a bar It's going to go to uh, Patrol Officer Boris Vragovic. Boris joined us uh, a couple of years ago, 2010. Uh, in this past year, he received uh, two commendations for excellent police work. Uh, one of them was for a, an arrest of an attempted break-in down at a house on Colchester Street at 7 a.m. when people are just getting up, getting going for the day, and we have people out here trying to cause misery to them. Um, fortunately, a, a neighbor saw this person trying to get into a door. Uh, Boris quickly responded uh, and caught him in an alleyway trying to get away. Uh, his second commendation was uh, based on a traffic stop. He pulled over two individuals in a car that was uh, committed a traffic violation on Harvard Street. Um, we tell everybody that it's really good that we have solid traffic enforcement because that, that stop ended up with a, uh, two subjects under arrest for drugs and firearm charges. Uh, and it was a real, an excellent job by Boris. Uh, he's been doing this work since he's got here, and uh, we know he's not going to slow down. So congratulations. We have a, a public service medal that we award, and it's awarded to an officer or officers for outstanding contributions to the department or community through their actions which reflect a high degree of accomplishment. And this year, there was two officers nominated for it, Lieutenant Derek Hayes and Officer Michael Desario. And Lieutenant Hayes has been with us since 1998, and you probably recognize him over here on the um, liquor stings. And <laughs> <laughs> Officer Desario has been with us since 2003. Uh, both of these uh, officers were nominated based on what they did for a young kid by the name of Nathan Norman down in Virginia. And this Nathan Norman is uh, suffering from terminal brain and spinal cancer, and he had a Christmas wish, and that was to receive cards from police officers and firefighters around the country. Well, some officer from uh, a neighboring community decided it might be good that we can just have the officers get into cruises from different departments and drive down. And once that got announced, um, I got a knock on the door by Officer Desario asking if he and the lieutenant could go down together. They didn't ask for anything for themselves. They just asked if they could take a cruiser, uh, which we did, and the, uh, the police union paid for the gas. And they drove down, stayed overnight, presented uh, Nathan with a uh, among other things, a Brookline police patch, a shirt, uh, and several cards that the officers had given to him, and I think they really made uh, the young man's day. And so with that, uh, his, their peers wanted them to get the Public Service Medal, and this year they'll be awarded that. We have another another medal. And this is our way of saying thanks to our officers who are activated uh, militarily. This year we had one, well 2012 we had one officer, Officer Dwayne Danforth, 
that get deployed uh, for the year into Afghanistan. Now, this is Duane's second deployment. Uh, he, in 2004, he was deployed to Iraq, um, where he served for a year, and uh, he stayed in the military. He joined us in 2009, uh, and he ended up uh, getting redeployed through most of the year of 2012. This deployment was a little bit different in that he was a supervisor, he was a sergeant of uh, several members of his platoon. He had responsibility of their safety, and he also had the big job of, of clearing the roads of IEDs, which they did uh, at various locations throughout Afghanistan. Um, I know when I talked to him when he came back, uh, he was very proud of the work that he did. I think they disarmed uh, well over 180 uh, IEDs during the time that they were there, and uh, everyone came home safely, which is a credit to Dwayne's leadership. So the Military Activation Medal goes to Dwayne Danforth this year. Now, last but not, not least, we have a Police Officer of the Year. And this award is presented to an officer who has distinguished himself or herself conspicuously by exceptional conduct, outstanding performance, or extraordinary contributions in accomplishing the mission of the Brookline Police Department. And this year we're going to honor Patrol Officer Morgan Lee. Morgan Lee is a graduate of Brookline High School. He's a Marine Corps veteran. He too served time in Iraq during his year of, years of service with the Marines. He joined our department in May of 2008, and he served in various assignments within our patrol division. And this award is one that um, we don't take lightly by any means. Um, the committee that the superintendent has put together has to take all the commendations that have been given throughout the year, sift through them, and then take a look at what work they thought was outstanding and who did it and how that person performs throughout his or her career. It's not an easy decision because there's a lot of good work that gets done but um, as in years past, we know that they made the right decisions when they recommended uh, Officer Morgan Lee for this award. He is one officer that I think you don't have to worry about. I know when you, you, I talk to his supervisors, he is constantly at work. When he's here, he does his job. He is thorough. And this year, he received a couple of commendations for our number one crime. Our number one crime, I think everybody knows, is car breakings. Um, and, and Morgan took really extra steps on two occasions to uh, take the initiative to go ahead and make stops, uh, do investigations, and make some pretty good arrests, which I, I want to briefly mention to you. Um, in July, we were getting a car break we were starting to see trouble happening down around the Kent Street area. And as you know, we give our information out to our officers, and we expect them to adjust their, their schedules and the, with their sergeants or by themselves. And, and go to those areas where the crimes are being committed. And this time was, was no different for Morgan Lee. During the early morning, July 14th, he stationed himself along uh, Kent Street, and he was able to see this guy wandering up and down the street, looking in the driveways, and all of a sudden he disappeared. Uh, Morgan stayed in the area. He ended up spotting the guy coming out of the driveway again, but he had changed his clothes, and he was carrying things. Uh, based on that, he made a stop. The stop resulted in the arrest of the subject uh, on his property, or with his property. He had evidence from car break-ins in Brookline, car break-ins in Boston, and residential home break-ins in Boston as well. He had a very long record, uh, he, and he was arrested and charged with nine separate crimes in the town of Brookline. But it gets better than that. Um, the mid-September into October, the north side of Brookline around Fuller Street um, probably had more than 30, 35 car break-ins. That's the ones that were reported to us, and we know that when people commit car break-ins, uh, a lot of times people come out and don't notice their car broken into us, think it's just changed and they don't call. Well, this one subject resulted in over 35 reports to the Brookline Police Department. At one time, um, a, a witness did see the man and described the man to us, so the officers that were assigned down there uh, had this description in their minds, and, and Morgan Lee in particular. Uh, a couple of weeks later, on October 4th, 
Morgan sees the guy fitting the description, uh, get off of, well, walk into the Shaw's supermarket uh, over the line in Brighton on Com Ave. Uh, he follows the guy in. The guy goes to a change machine and starts exchanging change for bills. Um, he lets him go. He speaks with the loss prevention officer in Shaw's. This, they give him some information. This guy comes in all the time. He's always exchanging coins. He always comes in, you know, after midnight. Um, and they, they started, uh, Morgan started to work to identify him. Sat with detectives, told him what he had. Uh, they went on a little bit further. A couple of days later, he comes back to Shaw's and guess who's waiting for him but Morgan. Um, he's riding a bike this time. He comes off, gets off the bike, can't account for the bike. The bike is an expensive bike worth over $2,500 and really doesn't have a good story about anything. Uh, the bike is seized and uh, followed up on. It's taken from a house break in Cambridge along with another break in, along with uh, a car break in, or two car break ins in Cambridge that exactly the same MO that all 35 of the car breaks in Brookline were. Needless to say, a warrant for his arrest was obtained. He was placed under arrest, uh, taken into custody, and guess what? No more car breaks. <laughs> so, two examples of what Morgan does day in and day out. Uh, well deserving of this award, and we're very honored to uh, let you know that. His peers have selected Morgan Lee as Police Officer of the Year 2012. I know Morgan's here with his very proud father, who is also a, a veteran and a longtime Brooklyn employee. Jerry? There you go. So, that's. What we would like, to, that's what we wanted to show you tonight. Just a little bit of the quality work that you know goes on uh, while a lot of people sleep and enjoy Brooklyn. Well, obviously, we, we'd all like to have a few words, but I, I, would you also like for us to have a group photograph? Yes. Okay, all right. Um, I, I just want to say, you know, we watch cop shows on television, and everybody has sort of a fantasy idea about what police work is. And when we hear these stories, which I know are not stories, they're telling us the truth, I am so impressed and so proud. And I am also blown away by the fact that somebody would bother to take all of the time and put all of the effort in that you guys do every day, up to including taking a trip down to Virginia to see a disabled young man. Um, no one understands what it's like in real life. And I think just to hear about this uh, is an education for everybody. And, and we're, we're all so, so very pleased and proud. It's like Mandela. Yes, I, I, congratulations to all of you and well deserved. And I just want to say that uh, when I hear these different, uh, st the, the different um, episodes that led to your awards, um, I, I am, and I, I, through the year, the chief sometimes tells us about different events as they come up too. And uh, what I'm convinced of is that not only are you bringing the crime rate down in Brooklyn, you're bringing the crime rate down in, in Boston and Cambridge and, and Everett and you know other places as, as you guys put in the, the work and catch the, the people that, that are doing these break-ins and things around the whole area. And, um, you know, I, I think it's really a testament to, we, we, we think the Brookline Police Force is, is top-notch, and uh, I'm happy to have it proven. Selectman Goldstein. Thanks. I just want to have my thank you, gentlemen. Uh, thank you for protecting property. Thank you for protecting life. And thank you for protecting the values of our community. Segment Benka. Yeah, I I noticed uh, that as some of you stood up, you seemed a little uncomfortable being singled out like this. Um, but uh, um, and and you may think that you're just doing your job, uh, but you represent the other officers in a department that sets very high standards for itself. And uh, I want to thank you and through you thank the other officers in the department. And I too will uh, add my thanks. Uh, I'm particularly uh, uh, warmed by uh, uh, one of the uh, apprehensions around the corner from my house at uh, Hardin Cypress. So thank you. 
Okay. Um, if you'd like to uh, have some photographs, we'll certainly join the officers, but uh, if you also want to have one just with everybody because there's so many of them, we could do that. Can, we'll, get, we'll get out of the way. Yeah, and, right. Yeah. You can have a picture. All right, now we're going to get back to the ordinary business. Um, Mr. Cirillo, can you hear me? Somewhere in the back? I was there a minute ago. I don't know, Chief Ford is here if you want to do that. All right, one. Chief Ford, Chief, would you like to come forward? Oh, there he is. Now he's there. Well, we'll do Chief. We'll, they're they're going to. We'll do public safety all together. So, Chief, you, you have a, uh, an equally important but slightly less dramatic <laughs> item. Yes, I, I would like to think so. It's Good equally evening. important. I said that. It's very important. Good evening. I'm here before you tonight to ask you to extend a conditional offers of employment to 10 individuals. These individuals are the first hires from the new civil service list. Uh, they're all Brookline residents. Oh, wow. They have passed an extensive background check by the Brooklyn, Brookline Police Department. They do a fantastic job of looking into each and every candidate. And all of the candidates have been interviewed by uh, Sandra DeBow, uh, Chief Ward, my Chief of Operations, Deputy Chief Corbett, the Training Chief, and myself. The, uh, just a little bit about the candidates. They've all passed our interview process, and uh, we feel they're uh, worthy of being given conditional offers of employment. But just a little bit of a background on them, of what maybe was said about them and some history. Uh, the first individual is Devin Ream. He has a bachelor's degree in history from Virginia Military Institute. He's currently serving in, uh, as a reserve member of the United States Marine Corps. I believe he uh, spent some time overseas. All of his previous employees and references describe him as intelligent, hardworking, and dependable. We have Mike Pierre Lewis, also a member of the National Guard, and he served in Afghanistan. Been described as a great motivator, with a good head on his shoulders, and works well under stressful situations. He told us he had wanted to be a firefighter since he was 10. <laughs> uh, Cormac Downing, described as honest, hardworking, and punctual purpose, 
recommended by uh, several people as being a, uh, will serve well with the Brookline Fire Department. Uh, Matthew uh, Shatkin, described by his past employees as honest, hardworking, respectful, and a great work ethic. He's a graduate of Colby College with a bachelor's degree in history. We have Zachariah. My, my alma mater, so it's going to be. <laughs> so he's in, right? He's in. He's in. Yeah. Uh, Zachary White currently attends Mass Bay Community College and he's receiving a certificate as a paramedic in June. Uh, he was a firefighter previously in California and uh, actually part of his duties out there were working out of a helicopter. It was needless, uh, pointless when we asked him if he was afraid of heights. <laughs> He uh, is described as hardworking, intelligent, and a loyal person, and who has uh, been trained to be a firefighter his whole life. He holds multiple certifications in different areas. Connor Monahan uh, is a was a pleasure to interview, and he brings uh, a little closure to a family group. He has three brothers that currently serve on the Brookline Fire Department, uh, all who are very well respected. He's described by past employees as also being a dedicated employee who gets along well with others. Demetrius Overut Oviedo. 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 Mm -hmm. He's described uh, as a hardworking individual, and he'll also be an asset to our department. Carl North, a he has a certificate from Boston EMS, currently works in the Brookline uh, Recreation Program and has for over 10 years. A uh, hard worker, reliable, and a good attitude. Uh, Michael O'Hearn, described as dependable, a matured employee who is both personal and trustworthy. And last but not least, Brian Mulkern, currently works at Tough Medical Center, and described as a, value, a valuable asset to the department, to the hospital, excuse me. For three years uh, prior to that, he worked as an EMT, so he's used to some stressful situations. I'm sure his skills will also be an asset to us. So those are the ten individuals that we have gone through the process to date. They have many more steps ahead of them, but we would like to offer them, uh, give them conditional offers of employment so we can move forward with the next phases. Well, that's great. Um, and as I recall, you, um, when you came to us before, you weren't sure you'd absolutely be able to fill all the slots, but you seem to have done a good job. Correct. Okay. Any questions from members of the board? Sounds like a good group. So I would move that we approve offers of conditional employment to the 10 candidates described by Chief Ford. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. And the chair votes aye. We look forward to meeting them. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Um, and now, Mr. Cirillo, we, we tried to find you before, but you were buried behind all of those all of blue. folks in the room. It's a burden to be short. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, I'm here, here before you this evening to uh, request authorization to fill a few positions in the finance department. Uh, we have a person who's worked for the payroll subdivision of the treasury division who is now moving on to uh, the school department to work in the school department, human resources uh, department. And so that position payroll coordinator will be opening up as of July 1st. Uh, we have, as you all know, we've gone through an extensive program of job sharing and cross training. We have uh, a, a young individual in, in the department who's actually cross trained in the payroll coordinated position for the last two years and uh, would fill that position very well. So I'm, if, uh, if you authorize the positions to be filled, I would be promoting that person to that role. And then, the, of course, that <laughs> opens up that vacancy, and I would have to um, ask authorization to fill that position. And that position is that of the head cashier of the treasurer's uh, division. That uh, role, uh, every dollar that comes into the town goes through that desk. <laughs> and it's booked in as receipts. And um, she also uh, does all of the vendor and payroll checks issued, uh, does all of the tailings, backs up all the payroll people, the assistant treasurer, and the assistant collector. So that's a valuable position uh, to be filled as well. And, and clearly a person in whom, A, we want to trust, and B, we want to know counts carefully. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Questions for Mr. Cirillo? 
Sigman Daly? Yes, I do. I actually, just while you're here, this is not uh, directly related to these positions, but I understand you've had a conversation with Moody's and you have some good news to tell us. Oh, yes. Uh, we had the conversation last week uh, and we have been granted the uh, AAA bond rating for the community for the 19th year in a row. Uh, I'm prepared to give a full report on the on the bond authorization, uh, excuse me, the the Moody's rating and the bond sale that was conducted this morning uh, at your next meeting on uh, May 28th. Great. We look forward to hearing more. And I just, I just want to thank Mr. Cirillo, Mr. Kleckner, and, and all who um, work on keeping that bond rating uh, AAA because as we're um, doing so many building projects right now be, to meet the demands of our growing uh, number of students, um, this, the, as I always explain this to people, this is like being able to get the mortgage at the most favorable rate instead of having to pay uh, a higher rate because your your credit is not as good. We are we are being we are able to borrow at the best possible rate, and, uh, and you I, will I, be delighted at the rate. <laughs> okay, great. You will be delighted next I'm week. Looking forward to hearing it. Okay. Uh, any other questions while we have Mr. Cirillo? Selectman Goldstein. Thank you. Uh, Steve, can you, can you quickly describe how you intend to uh, advertise for these, to fill these positions? And well, what um, mechanisms uh, the first position use? would be uh, an advertisement inside, in, internally. The next position, the uh, second position, the cashier's mm -hmm. position, we would advertise internally and externally. Uh, I hope uh, that there are people inside uh, that could do the role. Uh, and I'm always looking to promote people. Uh, at this point in time, nobody in uh, the office in the larger finance department has expressed any interest in it because it's a stressful position. Uh, but I would not be surprised if people internally, when I say internally, other town department employees maybe show some interest in that. Um, in the, at the same time, the person has to have a sharp uh, math accounting background. Uh, know several uh, software package language, including Munis, our main package. Um, so it's it's a it's a stressful position. It's one of the higher paid union positions in the in the town. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions for Mr. Cirillo? Um, all right, then I move that we. Oops, sorry, I've got to get my vote language. <clears throat> Authorize filling the following vacancies in the Treasurer Collector's Division of the Finance Department, Payroll Coordinator Classification T-5, and Head Cashier Classification C-9. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Benka? Aye. Selectman Goldstein? Aye. Selectman Wyshynski? Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you very Good much. Good luck. All right. Um, I think we've gotten through our personnel items, and the next on the calendar is a common victualler license um, for a change of owner, Spice Brookline, Spice of Brookline, are there persons here to represent Spice of Brookline, formerly Cafe Han. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, uh, would you just identify yourself for our recorder, please? Yes. Uh, my name is Ka Yang Wong. I'm the attorney representing the applicant. Yep. Um, 10 uh, Chen 2013 Corporation DBA Spice of Brookline. Uh, I have here with me uh, the owner of uh, Chen 2013 Corporation, Mr. Wei Chen. Uh, yes, we are here to for the application of the common pictures license at the location of uh, 1009 Beacon Street. Okay. And as I understand, this is uh, a change of taste, but not exactly um, cuisine. It's going from Korean to Thai. Is that correct? Uh, the current operator is a Korean restaurant, mm -hmm. and my client will open up a Thai okay. restaurant at the location. Um, Mainly, it's going to be a takeout restaurant. Uh, there are 14 seats, and right. we'll keep 
the 14 seat at the location, uh, there will be minimal renovations, mainly a uh, fresh coat of paint, uh, and also we will um, realign the, the exhaust duct work because right now it's in a strange angle, and we will just put it okay. on the same side of the the uh, the, the soaps, uh, on, on the left hand side of the, the restaurant. I, I noticed that there is a. Uh request to change the hours of operation. Uh, pre previously, the owner operated all, all days from 11 a.m. until 10 p.m., and the new owner is requesting 11 a.m. till 11 p.m. Sunday through Thursday and till 2 a.m. on Friday and Saturday. Is that correct? That, that's correct. All right. That's a substantial change. Uh, yes. Um, I'll let my client to explain. Cause he, he, he looks very young, he's 28 years old, and he has been in the restaurant business uh, with uh, his Just tell us who's, who's going to be there at 2 a.m. Um, okay. Yes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Wei Chen. Um, I will be the new owner of there. Um, the reason we are extending the time is, uh, well, actually, I'll be there, or my brother will be there to take over the restaurant until 2 o'clock. Then the reason why we are, we want to change the time to, from 11 to 2 o'clock on weekends because there's a lot of students around here and there's a train track right in front of the restaurants and um, some people, the students, they'll be studying really late and they'll be hungry sometimes and we hopefully will be there to feed their tummies, that's all. I see. And, and you're envisioning that a substantial part of your business will be takeout or people who order and take away? Correct. It'll okay. be a takeout restaurant, and uh, we'll, for people who comes in around when they get off the train, or when they finish study and they feel hungry, they'll mm. come down here to a takeout. So okay. That's the only main reason. Uh, questions for members of the board? Selectman Daly? Yeah, I, I have to say I was a pretty conscientious student back in my day, but I never studied in, until 2 a.m. and then went out for food. <laughs> Um, so the, um, that seems really late to me, and I want to ask those of you who are on the licensing commission, committee if uh, there are other people down there open that late. You know, I'd have to check. I'm guessing early, that guess some of say. the restaurants probably are, but I, I, I can't. I, see, I, I gather we have some neighbors here. Aha. Uh -huh. All right. Well, if this is the license that you're interested in, is there anybody there who wants to comment from the group? You have something you want to say? Well, uh, to, to, yeah. To hold, hold the really. You have to come Sorry, to the we, we, we need you to be at the microphone in order to officially hear what you're saying. Sorry. It's all being taped. Introduce yourself. Uh, please just give us your name for uh, the Doug record. Doug Hughes, and I live. Uh, You're a resident. It, yeah, at 78. Lived there for the last since okay. 1990. Um, and th there's a tapas restaurant that's open till 11 o'clock on Saturdays and yeah, Friday and, then, and Saturday. And then the yeah. um, uh, the pastry shop is closes about nine ten o'clock. Um, they're very quiet. I, there there was also I think there was music that was in this. There were, there was going to be. Um, uh, There's well, no, no liquor license. No, no liquor Just to be license. clear, this is this is not but, a license. This is not a liquor license. This is a common victualler, and but, it, it's but also it, was, it wasn't only the hours, but it was also there was an entertainment component to it, and that that, that you know that's actually pretty traditional. People play music kind of stuff just, inside. Just to have a yeah. television on or yeah. a radio on, you need an entertainment. It's license. not live no, entertainment. That's all they're asking. It's it, it, it's officially called. Um, radio and taped music, and it, yeah. it literally gives them permission to have a radio playing. The dry cleaners, you can hear the music. They ha they're open from 7 to 7, and, and 7 to 12, which is right next to your uh, shop, they're open to 7 to 12 on Saturdays. During the summer when they have the door open, you can hear the radio uh, clearly uh, in, in, uh, in our house the whole time it's going. And they're not playing at a loud volume. It's that close, and there's a little bit of an echo phenomenon. So having music playing till 11 o'clock, you know, is... is um, uh, the, the, the other restaurants don't have entertainment. They don't, on that side of the street, they don't have entertainment, and, and it's kept quiet. It's good neighbor. 
Um, and so the idea of, of having Muzak playing uh, uh, up to 11 o'clock. Just down at, yeah. the, at the end of Beacon yeah. Street. Where, uh, yeah, you're going to have to come up. Go ahead, come, come over there. If you want to respond, um, just, I, you, just speak into the microphone, please. Uh, Sorry. One comment. I, I believe 99.9% .9 of the restaurants, they do have entertainment lights. I think they do, probably, yes. yes. I, I believe they do. I would bet I'd anything have to check. that the other restaurants yeah. have yes. entertainment It's a very it's typical just... thing, and, and usually it's innocuous. Yeah, may, may I ask the, the train, how, how late was the train operation to you? I believe it's yeah, like 1.30. Yeah, it doesn't go till 2. Not till 2. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so there will be train noise on the street at 12.30. Yeah. I wonder if Cafe Han had an, an, an entertainment license. There's no way to check. Yes, uh, thank you for sending us this notice. I oh, am please do Lois identify yourself. I'm Lois yeah. Wernoff, and I am an abutter. My house uh, is 80 Monmouth Street, almost directly behind the Han restaurant. And I'm here to uh, uh, urge you not to... Uh, honor this um, application because uh, the, uh, in addition to uh, what Doug, uh, my neighbor, has just said about the uh, penetration of sound from the uh, restaurants, from the uh, row of, of uh, uh, businesses that are essentially uh, facing the backs of our houses uh, would be a, an intrusion. Uh, in particular, uh, the hours that have been uh, also questioned by uh, Nancy Daly, uh, the uh, idea of having uh, any uh, activity of that sort going on in our neighborhood at that hour, uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, is, I think, uh, something that our group here uh, would find very objectionable. Okay. Uh, just for the record, the Cafe Han had this license for entertainment, radio and taped music. They had a license. Well, Cafe Han did. You mean the, pre present? At the, they've had it for as long as they've been in business there. Mm -hmm. But they haven't been uh, open until uh, 2 o'clock in the morning. Okay, but I just want you to understand that someone was talking about the noise at the dry cleaner. These folks had the same loud, sorry, same ability to play taped music. Not, during, not supposed to be loud. No, no. Not supposed to be loud. The dry cleaner does not have to come to us for a license, so we can't say anything about it. But in, ca in this case, the predecessor operation had an entertainment license, and we never heard any complaints about it. Well, okay. Whether this uh, uh, change of, uh, in the timing will uh, uh, affect the uh, people who do come, uh, young people, people in college, uh, may also change uh, the nature of the, of the experience. I'd also like to point out, just for the information, um, we are a small domestic neighborhood. There are actually a row of five houses, and our uh, uh, habits are New England habits. We rise very early in the morning. I can vouch for that from all of my neighbors. Uh, we've discussed this. Uh, and the uh, uh, fact is that uh, we really don't suffer for a lack of restaurants on Beacon Street. Uh, just uh, uh, giving you a list of the, of the restaurants that are presently in uh, operation. Uh, the, uh, beginning on Carlton Street, we have the Busy Bee. Uh, we then have the Mission Cantina, which uh, is a new name for the old, old restaurant that was there. Uh, going, uh, approaching uh, St. Mary's, we have O'Leary's, uh, followed by Sichuan Garden, and on the corner of St. Mary's. You and know, uh, we, we actually know all about those. We give them licenses. Uh -huh. Thank you. Well, uh, my point simply is... You are trying to tell us that you should, do not want us to license this one? I think we are getting to the point where the sheer volume of business begins to impinge upon us in, an, in, a, in a number of ways. Parking, a very large issue for us. Uh, we have very limited space. 
uh, I'm trying to to uh, 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 simply give you a picture of what the environment is like. I, I think we're pr pretty familiar with the environment. Can I just ask a question, though, because I think one of you said, maybe it was your, your other neighbor who spoke, that Cafe Han River was a, a, a fairly good neighbor. I didn't say anything of the sort. Okay, okay so do, are you, you, you don't agree with that statement, that they were... Uh, I, s I would say that uh, the, the Cafe Han has been a neutral neighbor. Uh, okay. As far as I, I, have, I have no... So they haven't been objectionable on, on their hours and their level of noise is what I'm trying to get at. I'm trying to, I'm trying to pinpoint... Well, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't have that... Uh, I think I'm going to make it very clear. We cannot deny a license because you think there are too many restaurants in your neighborhood. We don't have that kind of authority. So but, but perhaps I, but the, you can explain hours, why you would like to oppose this, yeah. other than there are too many restaurants in your neighborhood. No, I'm just pointing out that the d degree of uh, activity increases. Okay, it's a commercial district. It's zoned and, and commercial. It they have any, they have zoning rights. Okay. Well, well, well I the think the domestic I, environment also has the rights. Yeah, I, I'm trying to get at what would you find acceptable. I mean, were were the the uh, the hours that Cafe Han River had until 10 at night, would you be, would the uh, going to 11 at night, one hour longer, is that acceptable to you? Or well, you I think, I, think I, I am speaking for myself and uh, perhaps some of my other neighbors might have some other concerns. Okay, and speaking for yourself, what, what, it, what is acceptable to you personally? I would uh, consider acceptable whatever the hours of the neighboring restaurant at present is. Okay. And Which I is do that, not that know. Is the, I uh, do not know what Spanish the, uh, place, right? Excuse me. That yes, that's, that's the Spanish place. Yeah. That's right. Okay. I'm not. I honestly don't know what their hours. We don't are. have that in okay. front of us. I, I mean, I, ha I, ha I can. I have to agree with you that 2 a.m. sounds uh, very late or early. I should say. I guess to me. And I understand when your houses are very close that why you have an objection to 2 a.m. What, what I, what I um, am trying to parse out here um, is basically the back of your house faces the back of the restaurant. Um, yes. I'm, is, there, is there anybody from Beacon Street who faces the front of the restaurant who is here? Okay. Um, you know, the, right, but, um, you know, the, if, if there, if the focus of the concern was traffic coming and going of customers through the front of the restaurant, um, I could, you know, and, and kids talking and things of that sort, I, I guess I could understand that, but I'm just wondering, what having the back of the restaurant, and, and as I look at the plan, there's basically a door that serves the back of the restaurant. Deliveries are through the front or the back? Through the front. front. Okay. Uh, um, I'm, I'm trying to understand what the issue is. Is the back door closed? Back door is going to be closed, yes. Back door has to be closed. The only reason going to be open is that when we bring the trash out, you can't. So you, you you're going to have to come up here if you're going to talk. Come in and stand in line and take your turn if you want to speak, but you have to speak into the microphone. I will say to the person seeking to relinquish this to. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I will say to the person seeking the license that we have had complaints at some other places where you're very close to residences about as you put the garbage out at the end of the evening, which, I mean, you're asking for 2 a.m., so you'll be putting the garbage out in the middle of the night for these folks. Um, you know, the, the rattling of bottles, the garbage, the door slamming, the lid on the uh, garbage bin slamming can be very obtrusive to neighbors. I understand that part, but of course, um, as a, you know, restaurants, I of course have to lower down the volume, the voice too, try to avoid that too, because if I was people that live around behind them, 
I don't want somebody slamming the bottle or jumping or do some really loud noise and then woke them up because they have to wake up really early in the morning to go to work. Or we have to be gentle and when we put the trash, we're not going to slam the door because you know, it's going to break the door if you slam too much. Okay. Everything you have to watch. Can, can I interject something quickly? That We do have a noise bylaw in, in the town that, uh, that covers the, the, the noise issues pretty pretty uh, clearly, uh, along with the nuisance bylaw. I do want to change the subject slightly while, you, while you're up there, though. Do you do uh, delivery? Yes, we do yeah. do deliveries. And have, have you made uh, provision for where your delivery vehicles will park? In the front, in and the but they do have a parking space in the back. That was the previous owner told us there was there is a parking lot in the back yeah. that they can park. Actually, it's only one space. Or two space because in the front, I mean, this yeah, night, I know it's gonna be really busy. It's Beacon in the Street, there's no, busy. I mean, that's not we gonna, gonna happen. probably use it the parking lot in the back around the daytime if there's no park in the front. Yeah, do you know if Han River was doing delivery? Was that do you know if your, your predecessor was doing delivery there, the current restaurant? We don't know. And, and you say you have a parking space in the back? In the back will be restaurant. Yes. And that delivery person, I imagine, will be accessing the restaurant through the back door, right? Not If, the, if they're parking in the back, they're going to be coming in and out through the back, right? In yes. the daytime or the nighttime? Nighttime. Nighttime, probably not. If it's going to, like I say again, if that noise is going to affect all the neighbors, and don't forget, I know there is a lot of residents in the front, in the back, in the rear. It's all surrounded by there. Yeah. And I don't want that. If, if I open up until 2 o'clock, yeah. I don't want that noise to wake up neighbors. How late would, you, would your delivery hours go? Probably around to like a 1 something. That's for, for my, also for my employees' safe too. Okay. You know? Thank you. And also, because I heard some neighbors talk yeah. about the, the, the music, uh, we will have no problem if we uh, shut down the music uh, after 12.30, after the... the well, we could limit your yeah. entertainment license yeah. hours. Yeah. Yeah, I mean this. It's, uh, excuse me. This actually 1009 actually backs onto um, the arts. Am I looking at? It's backs onto the arts center. Is that correct? What is, what is 80, 86 Monmouth? Is what? The corner is where the arts center is. Did. Where? Yeah. And here's 1009. Is right here. No, I think you. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if anything, the, the most directly impacted property, I, I would think, would be uh, 1011 Beacon Street. I, can, we, can we hear from some more of the neighbors? All right. There are other people who have, uh, would like to speak. Yes, please come forward. I'm uh, Sean Lynn Jones, a town meeting member from Precinct 1, and I live at uh, 53 Monmouth Street, just down the block from the side of the restaurant. And uh, before coming here, I went to the restaurant, I went in the restaurant, and I spent a lot of time in the alleyway behind the restaurant. And I just want to clarify a few things for the record before I, I comment on this particular application. Um, the way the alley is situated, it's almost like having an enclosed courtyard. You have two rows of three or four-story townhouses, almost back to back, separated by their backyards and the alleyway. And even though 1009 is somewhat to the end of that and behind the art center, noise is screened from either street, and any noise in that area just tends to reverberate around and carry very easily back and forth out from the back window, from the dumpster, across to the townhouses, 82, 80, 78, 76, and 74 there. That's just the geography. You have to understand you have very tall buildings that you know, really you know, contain the sound there. But that's why there's a noise issue. And second, just on the issue of the hours, the current hours for Han River are 11 a.m. until 9.30 p.m. Uh, They're licensed till 10 p.m. I was there and it says 9.30 p.m. Okay, on I'm the just door. saying, but we're, we have to go by the licensed yeah. hours. And, and it used to be 10.30, and they've changed it, and they put up a new sign. And it had been 10.30 p.m. previously, and they pasted up a sign to indicate the reduced hours. Uh, according to my colleague, uh, town meeting member from Precinct 1, Jim Franco, who just checked the website for the Taberna, they're open only until 11 p.m. I thought they might stay open until midnight, on, on weekends and in 10 on weeknights, but the website says they're open until 11 p.m. according to what he just uh, looked up. 
And I just point this out because there's a big difference between 11, even midnight, and 2 a.m. when you have this kind of area with the, the noise. And I think that's grounds for certainly considering limiting the hours if you're going to grant a license, and at the very least limiting the hours for the entertainment uh, license. Because on, on a hot summer night, uh, it's going to be very tempting to open that door. It's a small restaurant. It's going to be warm, the kitchen, and the door does enter, open right out onto that parking lot, which unlike the area next to Monmouth Park, is not screened off by the building at 123 St. Mary's. It's just completely open to the back of the townhouses and the art center that are on, on Monmouth Street. And uh, you might want to consider imposing some conditions, which I know you do sometimes when you have a, a license like this for a uh, review to see if there are any problems. But uh, I can't quite figure out why 2 a.m. is necessary because it does seem so much later than the other restaurants on that uh, particular block and uh, generally uh, in the neighborhood. And of all of the restaurants, this one's closest. Uh, Selectman Benka asked whether there was more impact on um, 1011 Beacon Street, which is immediately adjacent. Um, you know, there may be some, but noise tends to travel back and out and not around and then back in the, the windows. It's the, the way that the alley is configured. Uh, and I'm sure the wall between those two buildings is thick enough to prevent any noise from passing through. Uh, so I think it's a, a matter of at least, if not more noise, will carry across the alleyway directly out the back than will move through to the building uh, next door. So I just wanted to point this out uh, for uh, you know, the record, you know, based on you know, what I observed when I saw this, and uh, certainly the you know, back door, uh, I think, was open when I walked by this evening. It was hot, muggy, and uh, not, you know, understandably, they wanted some ventilation uh, in, in the place. Did you have noise coming out as you walked by with the back door open? I could hear the radio. And it was not a radio being played at high valve volume. It was just listening to the you know, news, I think. And it, it did carry you know, out through the open door. Okay. Can I make a suggestion? I want to ask the applicant, have you, have you had a chance to talk to the neighbors yet? Have you outreached to them at all? So maybe a good thing to do would be to kind of take a moment. We could continue this for a few minutes. Go out in the hall, see if there's a, if there's a, a set of hours that works well for everybody, and then, and then come back to us. Well, these people who are in line ought to get their chance to. Well, they, they could, but, but their, their comment could be obsolete if they can all work on something <laughs> together, too. I'm willing to hear them, but... Excuse me, I, I think you need to come to the microphone again, I'm sorry. Excuse me. My colleague just informed me that if it will work, makes the neighbor feels better and also the board feels better, then they will amend the application. They will close at 12.30. Okay. At the same time as the train stops. Okay. All right. I want, excuse me, I want to say something. First, the reason I want to extend it to 2 o'clock because there's a lot of students. They, like you said, ma'am, back in the days, it's different from now. A lot of, there's a lot of people get diplomas and they need jobs and they study hard. And then I'm a student before, you know, I stay late, I stay hard, and then I'm hungry sometimes. But if, like some people say that why they want restaurants closed at the same time. If everybody closed at the same time, then nobody stay open, and if somebody study up late and they're hungry, and then they disappointed because all the restaurants close at the same time. There's nobody there for them when they're hungry. I, I know. I hear from my that's the only reason. But I, I hear didn't from know. my kids when they're in town, they would like more restaurants open late. So I appreciate that. But when you are very close to neighbors, mm -hmm. we have to also have some consideration for uh, those those people, no. and you know, who are trying to sleep. Yeah, I understand that, but I didn't know it was brought up this whole attention, though. Yeah. That, was, mm -hmm. right. that was not my point, though. So uh, there are a couple of options before us right now. Well, One is that we can continue to hear comments, and then we can offer you the opportunity to consider um, what you would be, what would, what would be, I'm going to say, um, workable for you it, you've already suggested that you could reduce your hours on Saturday and Sunday to 12.30. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, the, the concern I think that we have, and I just, for the record, I flagged this before I even knew you were coming or knew you were here. 
Um, this is a very different set of hours from the other businesses that operate in the area. And it would be a change. It is, we have not heard complaints about the former operator. And the former operator was licensed to be open until 10 p.m. And now we understand that maybe recently they've reduced their hours. Uh, that may be cause of other issues having to do with family members, for all I know, and has nothing to do with uh, the reasons that the neighbors fear that there will be uh, disruption and noise. So, but what you need to understand from us is that 2 a.m. is a substantial change from the former operations and is worthy of our concern, whereas comparable hours would not be because it would not be a significant change in use. And that's why we are listening to this and trying to figure out how um, we can provide an approval that will not be disruptive in the neighborhood. Okay? All right. Sleitman Benka, you wanted well, to? I, there are, I think. I know. More there are more people, people who would like to speak, so we're going to um, give them a I'd, chance. I'd, I'd be inclined to hear their comments. Yep. And um, then we can go from there. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the board, my name is Beryl Sheaf. Uh, I own part of the uh, commercial block on the other side of Beacon Street, and I operated uh, Beacon Supermarket for 40 years uh, in the town of Brookline. Uh, I would like to speak in support of the applicant. Uh, this is a commercial area which has, for the past uh, uh, six years, had about three and a half years of disruption with quite a number of businesses going out of business. Uh, I think it's important uh, as long as the applicant is willing to meet the zoning bylaws and the, uh, and the restrictions as to the uh, time, and I understand that the Town of Brookline does allow under proper circumstances uh, commercial operations until 2 a.m. Uh, one thing I know from, from being in business for 40 years in Brookline is that there is never an issue of doing something which is going to be offensive to your neighbors, whether by noise, whether by odor. Uh, the, the board has in its powers and always, whether it's, whether it's the Board of Selectmen or whether it's the Health Department, always looks out for the best interests of the neighborhood to make sure that the conditions that are put upon a license are observed. And I think that uh, if you look at this from an um, um, economic point of view, that uh, if this is a question of uh, other businesses in the area that, uh, that uh, this gentleman would be competing with, being open in Boston until 2 o'clock and he's looking to try to, uh, try to compete with them, uh, if, if, uh, if he opens up and he's not doing business between 1 and 2, he'd be foolish to stay open from 1 to 2 and lose money. Uh, I think uh, if the board in its wisdom attaches licensing and perhaps a six-month review period to make sure that there uh, are not uh, complaints or, uh, or problems caused by the, you know, to the neighbors, that uh, if in fact uh, being open later at night would be uh, the difference between a, a, a business being successful or not successful, we've had enough businesses go out of business in this, in this commercial district, and I think it was something like seven over the last uh, year and a half, that uh, the board should do everything it can to nurture successful businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Mel Klaus, a former town meeting member, and uh, I think, uh, you know, the neighborhood is not really anti-business. I think, first of all, the noise issue is a problem. Sean Lynn did that very well. I live at 59 Monmouth Street, which is across the street and down just a little bit. I'm speaking for the Klauses, uh, so that you don't have to have another body up here before you. Uh, uh, so the noise is a real problem. I think that what may have set the neighborhood off was the 2 a.m. Uh, and music, uh, tape music. And I thought, my goodness, when I first read it, are we going to have a sports bar down here, which uh, did uh, cause eyebrows. This, this is non-alcoholic. I yeah. just want to be very yeah, clear. Uh, There's no alcoholic beverages involved here. Uh, we're aware of that now, but I think that... If the noise level were maintained and the hours of operation are what 
ever the other uh, businesses are, Taberno is a perfect neighbor. Uh, whatever goes on there, I never hear a noise any time at all. Uh, so that, that really works very well. The other thing about 2 a.m., if 2 a.m. is a going concern, the other neighbors will want to open until 2 a.m. as well. So there's that issue uh, that we'd have to deal with. So we are not interested in having a, a restaurant operating to 2 a.m. I'm sorry, I admire your entrepreneurial spirit. I really do, but I think if you can just keep it to 11 o'clock, the neighbors and the noise level down, uh, I think the neighbors would probably welcome you. Thank you. I'm uh, Elizabeth Kane. I live at 74 Monmouth Street, one of the townhouses that is behind uh, the restaurant and next to the art center. And I think that uh, the neighborhood does need to um, encourage commercial these commercial spaces that are empty right now to be filled. I'm not sure that the neighborhood needs uh, a, a place that's going to be open until 2 a.m., which I, I, I disagree. I think it'll, it'll be open until 2 a.m., and with the cleanup, it's what, open until 3 a.m., 2.30, by the time they clean up. Um, I've lived, I've spent a lot of my life living in apartments across the street from bars and from lots of restaurants that were opened late at night, and I think that once we let this happen where, you know, we say, okay, Oh, yes, we're going to keep the door closed at all hours, except when we bring out the trash. We know that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And the noise is going to ricochet off the buildings. Um, besides that, I mean, I would just question whether, and I mean, I don't know how you decide this, but does the neighborhood need a place for students? Is this the right neighborhood? Perhaps this type of um, restaurant or takeout place belongs in a different neighborhood. This might not be the right setup for this for what this plan is. Um, I, I'm just not sure this is the right neighborhood for, you know, if he's targeting students. There, yes, there are students in this neighborhood, but this, this is a neighborhood of professional people. People who have, you know, people who've lived in the neighborhood for some of them 25, 30, 40 years, raised their families. This is not a neighborhood. This is not, we're not at BU. This is not on BU's campus. Um, you know, and I, I question also that the takeout, the car doing takeout in the back, I think that's going to, if he's got a park, one or two parking spaces in the back and he plans to be using them for delivery, uh, that's going to pose, on top of the garbage, another noise issue. So I think that if he's applying for a license and you're going to grant it, I think it should be absolutely in line with all the other restaurants that are on, on Beacon Street and to Bernadahara on, uh, on, on the same row of commercial spaces that he's on. My name is Jim Franco. I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 1. Um, basically here to support the neighbors uh, with respect to the concern about hours that uh, uh, Selectman DeWitt mentioned from the get-go. Uh, Sean just mentioned, Sean Lynn Jones, another town meeting member, just mentioned to me that he received, in addition to the people here tonight, uh, before coming over for advisory committee meeting, at least half a dozen emails from other neighbors who could not be here, uh, focusing on this 2 a.m. Uh, 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 timetable. Um, I would like to make the comment that uh, whatever hours you decide to approve tonight, uh, you've got to plug in the fact that there will be cleanup, as was just mentioned. And that cleanup is going to be uh, going to involve going out the back door. So uh, it's disruptive to some extent uh, to the neighborhood. Um, this is the sleepy side, if you will, or the quiet side of Beacon Street in that St. Mary's commercial area. Um, uh, so this is, uh, that's why there's this, one of the reasons why there's this reaction uh, to the to the hours because they've never had a business that uh, that was trying to stretch the hours uh, this way. Uh, finally, I would urge you to um, whatever you consider, think about putting a condition, uh, perhaps a noise condition or a, a review before the re renewal, the the normal renewal of the license 
because this is a new business, uh, uh, a new owner, and uh, you might want to check it uh, uh, sooner than you would usually do. Mr. Sheaf uh, just mentioned that. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Alyssa, and I'm a student at Boston University. I was actually supposed to cover a new story for my class today, but um, I didn't know that um, this story is coming up, and I do live in Brookline, and I just want to say that as a 20-year-old, we do stay up till pretty late. Um, me and one of my friends, we stay up till 3, and it's not, it's, you know, it's, it's not nothing that's, like, questionable, and sometimes we do have to order food from Austin because all of the businesses are closed at really early um, in Brookline, and I understand, as the lady pointed out, that um, it's a neighborhood for young professionals, but let's not understand that things are changing here. We do have more students coming into this neighborhood and, you know, I just don't understand why do we, why does every set of business have to, like, operate at the same hour? Like, why do we have to be all homogenous? So, um, I'm not trying to sway our decision. I just want to point out the fact that, um, you know, Brookline is a very diverse neighborhood and it's not primarily made, it's not just made up of professionals and um, I guess longtime residents because I understand we're students and we're, you know, just renting apartments here, but we love this neighborhood and we, we want to live here um, for a longer period of time. So I hope that you can give the hours a deep thought and hopefully extend the hours a little bit because um, it is a it is a problem for me and my friends, and I live on St. Mary Street. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> um, the um, as I understand, we've we've had a um, offer from the um, applicant to reduce the hours from 2 a.m. until 12:30 p.m. on sorry 12:30 a.m. Uh, on Friday and Saturday. Um, we don't seem to have any dispute over the Sunday through Thursday hours, which are consistent with the other restaurant in the neighborhood. Right. And I, my, my inclination is to go that route and um, review um, what the performance is um, in six months or at, at the regular well, the, renewal time. Yeah, the renewal right. time right. is actually about six <coughs> the, months. It'll be, a little, be about right. six months yeah, from now. Right. Yeah. Which is to say for the neighborhood, we normally initiate annual reviews in September for a license renewal date of, of December 31st. And, and it, if, um, if there is an issue, um, uh, if, if this has adversely impacted the neighborhood, I expect we will see people back and if it hasn't, um, I expect that um, you won't feel the need to come back. Um, and actually, it's, it's conceivable that in six months, the time could be extended. Uh, it will be, it'll, I think, depend on what the applicant wants to do. And, and if, if uh, the applicant is out uh, banging the dumpster at one in the morning, I, well, I'm, you know, I'm I sure think we're going to let the applicant sh demonstrate. I'm sure okay, we'll, I'm sure we'll hear about it. Right. I, I, w I would like to suggest. I, I, I have no problem with Sunday through Thursday to eleven. That's already an hour later than the old restaurant. But as you say, it is the it's the Tavern same as Arrow, Arrow. hours. I'm going to suggest just midnight on uh, Friday and Saturday, um, I, as people pointed out. They have to do their cleanup afterward. And I'm particularly concerned when they're telling me that they're doing deliveries um, because the deliveries mean even if, even if nobody's coming up to the door, that the car is maybe driving off with the food, the door, you know, door in and out and whatever. Uh, I would just do uh, midnight on Friday and Saturday. And then if they want to come back and ask, uh, you know, if for longer and people say it's been fine, uh, you know. I have a question about deliveries. Um, do I understand that you would have your own vehicle to be used for deliveries? Is that correct? Oh, no. Not me. No. I'm going to have my own employee for delivery, as a delivery driver. Okay. And if I heard correctly, the expectation is that that person's vehicle would be behind the, behind the restaurant? 
Well, it depends on the business hour. If it's not busy, they have parking space, we allow the employee to park in the front. But if it's in a rush hour, they're not going to shut their engine off, park their car, and go inside, grab the food, because we have a free park in the front. The parking space. So yeah, we made park. an accommodation for somebody in Brookline Village who was doing deliveries, and I can't remember exactly how we dealt with that. So I was going to recommend sort of a hybrid, mm. which was to go with the 12:30 closing hour, but 12 o'clock uh, in deliveries at 12 o'clock, and then a little bit earlier. So there's a little less activity out the back, a little bit earlier. See how that works. We examine it. I don't. Again. I don't know if we can do that on the license. I don't think. Well, sure, we can put whatever conditions we want. Can we? Yeah, it's pretty complicated. <laughs> See, I, I, okay. I, I, was inclined, here. I was inclined actually to go to 11, yes. but I'm, I'm persuaded. Me. It's our, our turn to just speak now, please. Though, yeah, my struggle is, uh, you know, I, I want to, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing what the neighborhood is saying, yet I, I want to uh, encourage uh, commercial activity. Um, so I, I, I think um, 12 o'clock sounds like a good compromise. I'm, I'm supporting uh, Selectman Daly's. Uh. Well, given that there's no alcohol here, given that it's a takeout restaurant, given that it's not going to generate that much noise, you know, I, th I think a, a later hour is justified. I think, uh, you know, at least as an experiment, but I think everybody will find that that's not particularly intrusive. It's not, not going to be a big noise generating place. And, and, it, and also bear in mind that it, it really They're is. saying they already hear a lot of noise from the dry cleaners, though, so, yeah, well. you know. Yeah. May I ask just a question? Um, so I just want to make sure we understood um, correctly. So when he's doing his deliveries via car, he's saying he can't leave it on Beacon Street because he can't leave a car running on Beacon Street. So he's saying he's going to leave a car running. No, I don't believe alleyway. that's. that's I, I think you should. He's not going to leave a car running. Front, running. running. Yes. In the back. The store is right in the front. Nobody's going to jump into the car and steal the car. In the back, he can't leave the car running. No, no. I just want to be clear about this. I think what he meant was he's not going to double park the car in the front. I think that's that was. Or leave the car that, was, that was the message that I got was he wasn't going to be double parking on Beacon Street just and run in. Just looking at the assessor's map, um, the and, and obviously this is um, it's, it, trying to estimate the scale uh, using the scale on the map, but it seems that 82 Monmouth, which is the closest of this row of five, is about 120 feet or so from the back, maybe maybe a bit more from the back of this building, um, and going down to 74 Monmouth, which is uh, even further away. Um, it's you know I don't know what the conditions are with that courtyard, but uh, these buildings do not back right up to the back of this this building. I don't know how sound carries. I don't know how it travels um, in this area, uh, but I. I do think that some way we have to see how it works in practice. And uh, if it doesn't work, uh, then, um, uh, you know, the hours will have to be dealt with. And if it does work, um, the hours can, can, you know, remain the same or change um, based on the experience and based on this young man's uh, handling of uh, of his responsibility to the uh, neighborhood. And I do believe that, that Mr. Hahn has had a very clear message here about what sort of operation the neighborhood will find acceptable, um, which is to say I don't believe he's going to uh, be successful if there are neighbors calling us all the time about excess noise and neighborhood disruption. So I think he's heard very clearly that the neighborhood is hypersensitive uh, to what goes on there. I'm just, however, um, going to point out that the um, previous operation never created, uh, for us, no one ever complained about them. And in the operations, this will be pretty much identical to what was there before. 
the hours clearly are being that are being proposed are different, and um, we're very interested in trying to come up with something that will be economically viable for this operation and also will do what we can to mitigate against potential um, neighborhood disruption. I, I think there is one significant difference, though, as mm -hmm. I understand it. I don't think that the current operation has uh, – they may do some deliveries, I don't know, but I don't think that's a big element of their business. So there is going to be more – noise associated with this operation with uh, deliveries going in and out. Deliveries going in? There would well, be the I same mean, the, kind. The, the person coming into the building, you know, picking, up. picking up, going But the other out. operation had a takeout business, and certainly people were coming and picking up food and taking it out. Right, but we're hearing well, that this delivery could, person is going to be parking in the back. Could I make a comment? Sorry. Yeah. Let me tell you, Richard, the noise level will be significant. That alley is a very tight place, and it's not very far. I'll bet you there's not more than 50 or 60 feet from the back of one building to the other, because there's mm. only one. If it is, it's, it's not much more than that, it, no question, because Monmouth, 59 Monmouth Street is not that far down. And when you start making deliveries, I would recommend that the deliveries all be met, met and delivered from the front and not have the back deliveries and just park the car there if you can't get it on the street. But not having the doors opening and closing because that will affect those neighbors. No question about it. And you will have com comments, negative ones. I'm all for, uh, we're all for entrepreneurial spirit and business, but, you know, this is going to be different than what we have, and 11 o'clock is not a bad hour. I'm sorry. So thank you, and I won't interrupt again. <laughs> Could we compromise at like 11.30? Could we do something that's, you know, and then if everything goes well for six months, at, the, at six months we have a review, and if everything is quiet to 11.30, we could, we could look at it. It's just that we live there. And so while well, six months may not seem like long or a year may not seem like long, you know, when you have to get up at 5 every morning and, you know, you know you're going to bed early, disruptions in sleep is, is huge. And so the quality of our life. We're, we're all people who, who support our local businesses. We've signed petitions for local businesses. We helped develop the park. We've helped improve quality for the Brookline Arts Center. We're very active neighbors and we support, you know, we're very happy with the, um, with the, with, with the restaurants that have opened and, and the uh, shopping uh, that are there. We're, we're the consumers of those. Uh, we support students, but can we, can we start at something like 11.30 and if things go smoothly, then in six months or a year, look at it from that point, as opposed to starting later and then uh, having to mount evidence to, to go the other direction? You do realize they're talking about Monday through Thursday is only 11. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about you're talking about Friday and Saturday. Saturday. Friday and Saturday. I would argue against that, and I'm sympathetic to your, to your needs, but... but you know, this is a small business. They got a business model that's that's designed around selling to, to late night, and it's a, a tough tough spot to make a living in. Our commercial storefronts are uh, important to the vitality of the town, and I'd like to give this this uh, operator a chance to make his business model work. And uh, I don't think he's asking for very much by asking for 12:30. Two o'clock, I think, is asking for much. 12:30, I don't think, is asking for much on Friday and Saturday night. So I'd like to try and, and end this, this discussion because I think we've heard what there is to say. I'd like to make the motion to approve the application based on the hours as uh, indicated in the application for Monday through for um, Sunday through Thursday and the evening hours for uh, Friday and Saturday revised to from 11 a.m. to 2 o'clock to 11 a.m. to 12.30. On, with a provision that all deliveries end at, at midnight. Okay, we have a motion. Um, and I, how, how about adding to that a condition that 
Um, this is going to be subject to review at the time of license renewals, and at that time, neighbors will have the opportunity to come, and we'll make sure everybody's notified, and if there has been um, uh, neighborhood disruption, we will take it into account before we create any renewals. Absolutely. It's implied, but I yep. agree with the statement. Right. Let, me, let me ask a question. If we approve um, 1230 or 12 o'clock um, and there are issues before license renewal, can we change it in midstream or are we tied to that period until the license renewal process? I believe you would have to hold a public hearing. Yeah. Give notice and have a public no. hearing. Yeah. But, but, we, but could, we could. Yeah, we could. We could shorten it or <coughs> lengthen it well, before the regular. I think we'd have a hard time yeah. lengthening it. I'm sure we could. We could shorten it though. Right. Licenses are normally um, for the period from the initial licensing through December 31st of that calendar year. This license, like all other licenses, will be reviewed in the fall, and the review process starts in September. We get our reports in um, October and November and vote the renewals, um, presumably in the month of December, for uh, the following calendar year. That's the, that's the calendar for the reviews. I, I, I question the usefulness of the delivery um, cutting deliveries off earlier. I, 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 I don't see deliveries as being especially intrusive. I think the intrusive. access through the back alley is, you know, if anything's going to bother those neighbors, that's what's going to bother those neighbors. So, if I and, may, and, um, and one of the ideas behind staggering the times is, well, that will, that will help us indicate if there's a problem because there'll be a, there'll be a difference in the operation separation. For, the, for that half hour and people will be able to come back to us and say, yes, I, I notice a difference between how much I'm disturbed at, you know, 1230 and how much mm -hmm. I'm disturbed at quarter of 12. And, but. Okay. Uh, I was going to say that because my client told me that at, at night on Beacon Street there will be parking. So the Probably yes. It should be. It would likely be, be possible the for the yeah. Mm -hmm. Rather than to the back. Sometimes be, there yeah. is. Sometimes there. Yeah. Is. Sometimes. Except there when is. the Red Sox are playing. Depends, depends on Sox Sox what's going on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well. All right. All right. We we have a motion which we can vote or we can well, have an amendment. Can amend it. All right. Okay. Anybody I'll, I'll move it? to amend. All right. Uh, I'm a move to amend the uh, Friday to Saturday hours to 11 a.m. to 12 midnight. Okay. I'll second that. Um, but I, I'm, I'm actually doing it with the understanding that the owner could come back in um, if, if this is the way we go. If, yeah, we, there's, if, we go if to there's no minutes. problem, I'm willing to go to 12:30 when he comes back. If the neighbors I mean, say even he's fine. even before December, if um, uh, you know, if if uh, he finds that it, it doesn't work uh, economically and uh, that he needs the extra half hour, um, I would certainly be inclined to hear it even before uh, December renewal. As would I. That that would be great because my concern is the the business so competitive. Um, yeah. that there might not be a business at the yeah. end of the year. Well, so. well you, we, it, it would be acceptable for a request to change hours. You just need to apply to change hours. Whatever we vote, the operator can come back and ask for a change of hours whenever. I mean, there's no time limit on that. I mean, mm -hmm. theoretically, uh, in two months, you could come back to us and ask for a change of hours. That's allowed. It's permitted. It's, there's no problem about the request. It might or might not be granted, but you certainly could ask for a change of hours. Yeah, but let me suggest that you think very carefully about what you're doing at lunchtime, because that has always, uh, Han River's actually been there for a long time, and I think they do a lot of their business at lunch, because there are students in the area and people looking for a, a quick lunch, and so, you know, that I think that uh, you can... Do, do a lot of your business earlier in the day. We, we will try to get us any hour. Okay. Opening hour. All right. So um, 
the um, vote before us is the amendment to um, approve this uh, common victualler license with um, hours from Sunday through Thursday, 11 a.m. to 11 p.m., and Friday and Saturday from 11 a.m. until 12 midnight. <coughs> All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Binka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. I'm sorry, a point of order. Uh, I Votes to amend. It's well, an yeah. amendment. Oh, you vote. The, so if that fails. Just, just the then. amendment vote. Just the okay. amendment. So no, sorry, I'm amending no, the no hours. Amendment. That's all. Just Thank amending no the amendment. hours. That's all. It's on the amendment. How did you vote? No. No. Okay. <laughs> Selectman <laughs> Wyshynski. Uh, yes, aye. All right. And I'm going to vote aye. So I believe we have amended the hours. Um, now, is uh, Selectman Goldstein, do you still want to try to change delivery, so separate no, it from no, the closing hours? Okay. All right. Then I think we're back to where we should have been when we considered this. Um, which is the first question is to approve the application of Spice of Brookline for a common victualler license. Hours to be from 11 a.m. until 11 p.m. Sunday through Thursday and 11 a.m. until 12 midnight Friday and Saturday. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Chair votes aye. And the second vote is for a um, an entertainment license. And I move that we approve application of Chen 2013, Spice, doing business as Spice of Brookline, holder of a common victualler license at 1009 Beacon Street for an entertainment license including radio, TV, and taped music. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Chair votes aye. Okay. Good luck. Go to the microphone. <laughs> In the notice that we received, the license uh, actually states uh, for a common victualizer. That's victualizer. correct. Victualer. Yes. Right. Is that not alcohol? No. no. That's food. food. Victuals are things you eat. It's just uh -huh. food. Alcohol would be called alcoholic beverage. Oh, very good. Victualer is non, uh, th there is no alcohol. This license does not in any way provide permission to sell alcohol. Mm -hmm. Okay. The second question would be that insofar as the hours which you have uh, addressed uh, have been modified, and in your uh, amendment, you uh, call for the uh, uh, ability of the uh, uh, owner of this uh, uh, restaurant to write a letter uh, requesting an extension of the hours. Would that uh, privilege also be offered to the abutters? No. It, You're not, not a license holder. No, but they it's not a letter. It's not a letter. They can request a change of hours. That's part of the conditions of their license. But they would but have to come back. They would have to us. apply. Then what, then, but, what, at, at, then what do we do as a butters? I think we said them. we you will review the this, and we will be reviewing the license in the fall. And at that time, if we have heard complaints from now until then, and or if neighbors come to the time when the reviewals, re renewals are being reviewed, then uh, you can oppose the hours. The licenses, as a matter of course, are reviewed every year and renewed every year. Mm -hmm. um, we will do that. Uh, the license, uh, if there is no change, this license will run until the end of the calendar year. The calendar uh, we, we December 31st. The, the license will be effective through December 31st. We go through right. the renewal process before that, uh, at, during the late fall, um, and uh, uh, you know a month or two before the 
licenses are renewed, and that would be an opportunity every year for abutters, neighbors, or fans of this restaurant to come in and uh, offer their opinion. And will we be receiving notices as you have sent them on this occasion um, at that time? Probably not. I don't think change. you, if it's an annual review, well, I don't believe so. So it will be up to us to It'll be, be posted in our calendar when we do renewals. And is that publicly available? It's publicly available, yes. The, on the, the town internet, has that on, on the, the website? website. Yep. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can also um, check in with the selectman's office and say, can you tell me about when this is, you know, I would say November, check in and say, can you give me an idea about when this is coming up so I know when to keep my eye out for it? Mm -hmm. And Thank you very much. And if you have complaints in the meantime, call the health yeah, department right. or the police department. Right. Yeah. That's. I mean, people do that all the time, and that's that's the. Right and it will call. go on the record. We, we will hear about it. All right. Next item is Beacon Street Tavern with a name change, and I assume a menu change. And will the record reflect that I'm? Recusing myself on this matter due to a business relationship. Okay. Are you changing the hours? Ha, no. Okay. But you do have a um, request that is, uh, as I believe you are aware, was not able to be considered under this application. I, f I did find this out, and it was a little uh, after the fact. I don't know all the bylaws, but it was... Uh, a pool table, a non-retail pool table request that I believe Pat called me in the office and said you need seven days in advance and it was our yeah. fault and... Well, we, we, we have to post this. She said it was there, the office's fault that it wasn't posted and that for me, I'd like to open in a week and that will have to be done without the possibility of a non-retail pool table and then the next meeting was the 4th or the 11th I then think it'll we, be the 11th. Then we were told the 18th. Oh, really? Okay. So we're talking, you know, it's a month Sorry away. about that. Uh, I, I have to tell that. you, sir, it's not at all clear to me you're going to get a pool table. So well, don't, that, <laughs> don't hold your breath. The timing from when we asked for it was okay. about six or seven weeks ago at least. So it's right. been a very slow process. Well, mm -hmm. you know what they say, pool starts with P, that rhymes with T, and it's <laughs> trouble. Right. Um, however... In, with regard to the uh, other components of your application, yes. um, this is a change not of owner, but change of name, change of operations, and change of managers. Yes. From, uh, you're, you have a, uh, both a change of manager and you're proposing an alternate manager. Correct. Right. Okay. Um, the, uh, the uh, our GM, the manager, would have been here today, but he's having a baby today. Oh, well, that's exciting. Um, that's why. <laughs> the documentation for the managers has been approved. They are uh, safe service certified. I don't think there's any question about that. Um, Can I just ask a question sure, about that? Please. Um, you, you certainly are down on the area of Beacon Street where we tend to get a lot of students and so I assume people at your establishment are very conscientious and these pro the proposed manager and uh, backup manager would be very aware of um, asking for identification. We're very vigilant with that. I think you've passed your stings, actually. Um, I will point out that this um, current license is we're not, there are not going to be any changes. There is an entertainment license, and it is approved Sunday through Saturday from 11 a.m. till 2 a.m. Currently, we are only open from 5 till 2. We may do lunch in the future, but okay. that'll be... You need to tell us when you change your operations. Sure. Um, because we actually should not be authorizing a license for hours that are not the hours of operations. In this case, 
think with the change of name, it's it's not a transfer, so it's it's not directly applicable. But uh, we're supposed to hear whenever you change your um, operations, and ours are a significant uh, part of that. Okay. Um, any questions? Yeah, I'm I'm actually just reading the statute regarding. Yeah licensing for billiards, pool, and other similar other, bowling whatever alleys. Whatever that is. What is that other thing? Um, as I read this application, or the letter in here, um, you're not charging, you're not planning to charge for the pool table. Nope. And the statute that is cited um, requiring the seven-day hearing uh, states that the selectment of any town may grant or may suspend or revoke at pleasure a license which shall be subject to sections 202 to 205 inclusive to a person to keep a billiard pool or Scipio table, whatever that is, or a bowling alley for higher gain or reward upon such terms and conditions as they deem proper. And then it goes to on. To be used for amusement merely and not for the purpose purposes of gaming. Purposes of gaming yeah. for money or for property. So I don't think this is going to be used for gaming. No. But it, it does have the provision about for higher gain or reward. And if town council is here, I would be curious, is still in the building, I would be curious to know whether, um, whether we actually need the seven-day notice for a free pool table. Well, I was, uh, it was actually the associate town council who uh, advised me on this. Uh, I don't believe she is here, but uh, she reviewed the statute and she advised us to. Uh, we, it, I read the part that said no original license shall be granted under the provisions except after a public hearing, and that was it. Yeah, and we've got, we certainly have the public hearing. Ah, my goodness, town council is here. We only have to think think the thought, and she's on the spot to answer the question. Hi, I'm Jennifer Gilbert. Well, I was watching live streaming on my computer, so I heard <laughs> the question. Uh, so f so it, when I was asked, I didn't have the application in front of me, but I would say that for higher gain or reward, uh, depending on how the pool table is going to be set up, and most pool tables have sort of a coin um, operated, I would say it would fall under that then. That, that it would. But, yeah. But the, I just don't know what type of a pool table. Yeah, the application says it would be free of charge, not coin operated. Oh, okay. I didn't have the application. I just Sunday, had the statute. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, slow nights. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, you know, business tends to get a little slower on the Sunday, Monday, Tuesday of the week. We have a back room that we do a lot of business in, but it's only for private parties, and then we open it up for overflow Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We have a we had would have a pool table in there that has a covered top that we can also use for a dining room table. We're planning on using it on our slower nights only, just for joy of the customer. No money charged, no betting, no gambling for three days a week. That was our plan. So I I wonder whether that even needs a license, if it's not a coin operated. It's not under the same no, I'm. I'm yeah. if, if there are no charges, um, no gain, no reward, I would say it wouldn't fall under that particular license licensing statute. Then, so it's not under entertainment. And as part of the entertainment license, mm -hmm. I wouldn't. I don't. I don't know the answer to that. I think that's so how we. To, I think that's how we got it originally. But the what I think the point is here is we don't need the seven day notice, notice right. for a hearing. If it's not um, coin operated or charged for, for in any or way, or charged, is that there's a fee to come in and use it. No, that or appears like to that. be what the statute says. Right. So we could consider it under the um, entertainment. Uh, if it needs a license. License, if it needs one. I would um, have to check under the entertainment license if you'd have to modify the entertainment license. I just don't know the answer to that standing here. That would that was not a question posed to me, and I'd have to look that up. Okay. Yeah. I'm wondering, do you think we could just do this? Conditionally, based on, on your review, um, since it, it appears that we don't need the seven-day published notice. Um, 
Well, I don't, I don't think you could issue the license until you've got a ruling from me on it. I wouldn't feel comfortable with that. I certainly would not feel comfortable. Okay. Um, so okay. can we can we leave it that um, but we, we don't have to take any position? If on he it, doesn't so. need any kind of, it doesn't even need it referenced on his entertainment license. We can have somebody from the selectman's office call him and tell him just go ahead. Right. Right. I mean, th it's a v it's a very very narrow question. And that is. It does a pool is a pool table considered a form of entertainment a under the free enter pool table. a free pool table under mm -hmm. the entertainment license right very uh, narrow question I understand mm -hmm. the issue uh, how, and I also I think though that the concern um, that has led to the delay was a belief that a public hearing had to be noticed with the seven day notice and the publication in the paper that does not appear to be the case for a free correct pool table. Correct. If a free pool table requires an entertainment license, we actually could do this at our meeting prior to town meeting without a public hearing. We right, don't because there's our we don't we don't need a public we don't need the notice public hearing for a free pool table. And that was the reason we, we said we can't we can't hold That's a public right. hearing before a town meeting. So we could pass on this if we're not going to do it today, we could pass on this we next could, week. We could pot potentially reschedule it. For next, I mean, we could do everything but the pool table what, today. What types of licenses currently exist at this establishment besides the liquor? It's got liquor, it's common victualler, it's got entertainment. Okay, that's correct then, if it already has already has all three of I those. mean, the, the entertainment license is a radio, tape, music, and TV, standard. So we could... I, th I think what you should do is vote to continue it to uh, next week. Vote to continue this matter until we next week. We can vote the name change and the You can vote we the can name change that. and yeah. with, the, with the remainder just simply, um, you can, after, after you've heard from everybody, you could close that portion of the hearing and continue the rest of it to Tuesday. Okay? Yeah. That would be my I think that makes sense. But okay. we don't want to delay the applicant's ability to open. Well, no, no, we're not. His name no, change and his no, manager, he, he right. can open. No, he, he can still the cover open. on the pool table. Yeah, yeah. Keep you the, know, yeah. So the only thing that affects keep using is the, the pool table, is the as pool a table. table yeah. which may or may not need an entertainment license right. at all. And if it needs an entertainment license, it's a modification it does not to need the existing. A further public hearing. That's right, because so you're continuing this matter. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. Thank you for streaming on your computer. Okay, um, I hope we've reached now an understanding of our uh, actions under this item. Can I just ask one question, though? Uh, so I'm, I'm just gathering from your name change, are you changing to a sort of Mexican food yes. menu? Yes. We have a uh, Mexican, a partner and myself, have a Mexican restaurant in Amherst. We've had one for about Mission Canteen. It's also the same name. Had one for, I think, a year and three quarters now. And it's gone extremely well. And we are bringing the concept down here, which I think will go great. I wouldn't take a chance and just open a place, period. It's a proven winner, and it will work well here. All right, this is a public hearing. Is there anyone present who wishes to speak either in favor or in opposition to this application? Nobody. All right, then I believe we can um, first we will uh, vote on the items and then we will continue this hearing for a week until we resolve the matter of the pool table. So I move that we approve the application of DBGF LLC doing business as Beacon Street Tavern, holder of an all kinds beverage license as a common victualler at 1032 Beacon Street to change its DBA from Beacon Street Tavern to Mission Cantina. Then I also move a change in manager from Paul Walsh to Tiernan B. Smith. And I also move that we approve an alternate manager, Lauren L. Vargas. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Benka? Aye. Selectman Wyshynski? Aye. Chair votes aye. And this matter will be continued until our next meeting on Tuesday the 28th. All right. Now, 
we will be meeting on Tuesday the 28th, not here, oh. but at Brookline High School. Brookline High School. It will be the first night of town meeting. Um, and we meet in a classroom um, and 209? Room 209. Okay. Okay. And, um, you know, we, we actually, I think, uh, can get, the Selectman's Office can get notice to you uh, with regard to whether you need an entertainment license for the pool table after Town Council has reviewed that question. Uh, and if you do, um, whether you need, you know, you can always show up. Um, but um, there hasn't been any objection to the concept here today. Uh, it's so. not clear to me that it was properly noticed and people even knew that it was an application okay. for a pool table, which right. is why the public notice part of it could have been more significant and to have just blown it away might or might not have been a good idea. Okay. However, that's it. You've been voted a new name and new management, new managers. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. All right, next item is Hobson Scotch modification of the entertainment license. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Madam Chair, members of the board, my name is Adam Barnowski, the law practice at 300 Washington Street. I'm here on behalf of D2 Restaurants LLC. With me is Darren Toe. He's the co-owner and the manager of the license. Uh, here tonight to amend their license to add three items, instrumental music, vocal music, and a trivia night. Uh, they are currently licensed for radio, television, and tape music. Uh, as the board uh, will recall, Hops and Scotch has two floors, the first floor being a bar with, uh, with some uh, with some seating and a larger dining room on the second floor. What they're looking to do is to put the instrumental music and vocals only up on that second floor in one isolated area. Uh, they'd like to have the option to provide live ac accompaniment uh, to dinner service, private functions, etc. Uh, they're not looking for this to be a, a source of entertainment or for it to have any sort of specific draw. They're really just looking to replace tape music or radio with a live music setting, a classical guitarist or a, a pianist, a small jazz trio maybe having a vocalist in there. Uh, they're not looking to have concerts or battle the bands or full drum sets or anything like that. <laughs> uh, just seeking something quiet and small and uh, it's an amenity that uh, it's really seen less and less and less today with uh, all the media that's available. Uh, as far as the trivia, they're looking to have trivia once once a week on either a Monday or a Tuesday. It'll be very traditional. Uh, there'll be a simple setup. You'll have a host with a small PA, trivia on sports and uh, pop culture, local history, etc. There'll be no betting involved, no buy-ins, anything like that. They might have a, uh, some sort of a prize uh, as far as a voucher for food only, t-shirts, things of that sort. Uh, happy to answer any questions the board may have. Okay, and I'm going to observe that the proposal is for music from 6 p.m. until 11 p.m., but your current entertainment license for radio, tape, music, etc., actually goes until 2 a.m., and I think we would need to modify that. I, I believe they're looking to still have the uh, uh, ability to have taped music. I think this was just, I, I'm not sure if you can kind of split the entertainment license like that, but they're really just looking for the, th the things they've requested here. Well, we can do, cutoff. we can do, I think we can modify the entertainment license to indicate that the um, existing uh, recorded music would not be changed, but we can add the conditions for the um, instrumental music, vocal music, and trivia. That would be agreeable. Thank you. All right. So maybe it's an amended entertainment license. Where is the town council when we need her? Um, all right. Are there any questions from members of the board? Yes, I have one. Go ahead. Um, well, as a mother of a musician, I'm always I always vote in favor of live music, but I, I do want to caution you about the amplification, you know, because so some sometimes people turn that up too loud, and it, it does become an issue for neighboring businesses. Or I think I don't know if you have any residential right 
backing up to, uh, to you as we do heard with an earlier applicant, I, but there is some not too far away. So just be mindful of that. Absolutely. And I never even realized that there, when you said there would be no betting with Trivia Night. I didn't know Trivia Nights had betting. I didn't either. So I, I, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that was a question that came up. Um, Adam, you'll have to tell us more yeah. about that later okay. at some other sure. time. Yeah. That'd be a good trivia question, actually. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Then I'm, I'm going to um, move that we approve the application of D2 Restaurant LLC doing business as Hops and Scotch, Hops and Scotch, sorry. Holder of an all kinds alcoholic beverage license is a common victualer at 1306 Beacon Street to amend the entertainment license to include instrumental music, vocalists, and a trivia night. Uh, sorry, instrumental music and vocalists on Sunday through Wednesday nights from 11, 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. And a trivia night Monday and Tuesday nights from 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. All right, next is additional outdoor seating. Again, for the record, my name is Adam Barnas. Oh, you're back office. again. Yes, back again. With the law officer, Robert <laughs> Allen, 300 Washington Street. Uh, with me is uh, Jason Bosk, the general manager of Barcelona, and Scott Lawton, who is uh, the licensed manager and co-owner of the business. All right, I have a very serious technical question. I cannot figure out these drawings. I tried my hardest to understand where the bottoms of the people are going to sit on these funny bars that are drawn on the sketch so I'm, I'm with you I was right. trying to figure out where the 84 seats were right we are this. we are puzzled I would say mystified by so, this um, so yes yeah, to start with a technical question to address uh, the chair's concern and, and certainly we might want to have one of the managers come before the board and uh, explain but it looks like it's a combination of of bench seating and individual seats if you look to your right if you're if you're facing the entrance you'll have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven tables. I get the table ones. Tops. They're they're pretty clear. You can figure out where the people right. sit at the table. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. They're they're low seating, um, teak type furniture with. Uh, it's almost like um, closest thing would be a picnic table. A almost. picnic so table. Very similar. Aha. But okay. The little squares or little stools. Then I begin to understand. Yes. Yeah, I don't, They're picnic I, I tables. I can't get 60, though, over on that All right, race. and, um, right. <laughs> Still can't figure out where they're all going to be um, sitting. Well, if you, if you look at it, in between, if you look at the little squares, yeah. you see the larger rectangles across from them. Those are tables. Right. And then the next square is actually a long sort of couch-like wooden so there'll be four. Will there be four people oh. sit, sitting back to back? Yes. Yeah, so uh, if you go to the center of it, they actually will have their backs to each other. Oh, on a, on that's benches. that's what gotcha. it is. Yeah, okay. We've we've done it before. It looks really great. Um, it's a nice okay. low seating, and uh, it just doesn't look like a sea of tables. So. All right. So there'll be sixteen people at each one of those. Oh, I see. When did you if, if, if we yeah. maximize it, if, yeah. if, if okay. every seat gets full. Well, that's, it, that would be your maximum capacity, theoretically. You could have fewer on the bench, right? Usually yeah. Have these yeah, right. Okay, well, and that certainly other helps. Side. Oh, yeah, I don't understand the other side. I don't yeah, have a problem with the dining side, but the bar side doesn't seem to have any tables. Yeah, that is, they're equally confusing. All of it's confusing. The other side is, is a uh, lower, lower seating. And it's it's the, the there are tables. There's if you look at like I said, if you look at the little squares, mm -hmm. the very small squares. Those are actual stools. They're okay. Little low stools that you sit on. All right. Um, and then you're sitting across from a table, and then the next square that looks the same as the table is the sort of couch-like. Uh huh. And then the other one backs up to it. So it's kind of like table. booth seating. It is kind of like booth seating, but oh. on the outside you have two little stools that you sit on. Mm. Okay. We can provide you with pictures if you like. We have 
<laughs> yeah, I, 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 I actually am usually pretty good at reading drawings, but these were a mystery to me. Okay. I, I guess we now understand better how the 84 people could be seated, uh, which is only, I think, the really significant thing. Um, and basically what I understand you're doing is expanding into the area that's to the west of the entrance vestibule, is that right? No? No, there, there's actually no, uh, there's going to be no expansion. The, the Oh, this yeah. is just rearranging the exactly. existing was, space. It's, it's a very, very large space. Yeah. And okay. there's uh, okay. certainly demand for outdoor seating I see. in okay. the area. Can I make right. a comment? I, I, was, yeah. I was there a couple Saturday nights ago. And the only, my only comment is that the, in the area where you say bar, outdoor dining area, because you guys are so popular, uh, that's where people were waiting for to be seated and for tables. Mm. And it was getting pretty crowded in your vestibule there of people waiting. And it just occurs to me that by making this bar, outdoor dining area into a, a new seating area, you're not going to have a place for people to... To wait, wait for their tables. You're, you're not going to have to wait because they're going to have. Uh, well, I get that. I get that dynamic too. But uh, and do you have a strategy for what you do? You actually made people very comfortable and served them uh, um, um, sangria while they were waiting, which is uh, <laughs> fantastic. But but. Um, well, we have a very good problem on our hands right now, yes. um, and it is that we are very busy. But what we've been doing on Fridays and Saturday evenings is actually. When once these seats are full and the bar area is <clears throat> full enough that we feel it's congested, that it doesn't feel we don't want it to get too uncomfortable for the guests. We actually start start turning people away at that point at the at, at the front door, and uh, we've actually gotten a lot of feedback from the fireplace and the Abbey that they've gotten some great spillover business from it. And, uh, they're actually really happy. Ooh, about that's it. painful. Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. Um, I, I actually um, just kind of a nit. Um, you're asking for 84 seats outdoors, and this plan shows 64. It shows no. 40 on the. No, it's 84. It's, it's actually 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 60. 60 and 4. Oh, okay. 60 and 24. Left. So where do we get it's the 60? It's doubling. It's it's. Well, it's the why we couldn't read the. It's. You can't read. See the, those. This okay on the on this. We get twenty eight at the at the These tables. These are actually yeah. seats in here. Yep. No, I, I twenty eight at the exterior tables. Those, I mean, we we have to take it on faith because you can't count from the way these are drawn. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I, I got you. Them. I got you. Yep. No, that's okay. Now, I, yeah. All right. Yep. Are okay. we clear about this? Now I'm clear. And, and we know what be, we're being asked to do, which is to increase the seating from 36 to 84. And we know where they are roughly. Good. All right, no other changes? No other changes. The interior seating will stay the same. Okay. Will this, will this be the largest outdoor dining and table? Probably. Yes. I, I, think I well. would say so, yeah, most That's likely. Fine. I think it was previously at its last incarnation too. There was substantial out uh, seating there when it was. Uh, what was it? Thank you. I should know that. But, yeah. <laughs> and and I am assuming that um, you're aware of the um, DPW's concerns about intruding on the public ways. Yes. And yes. Absolutely. You have you have you are you are warned about that, or on notice about that. Okay. Any other questions? Then I don't believe this one is a public hearing, so I think I can move that we approve the request of Barcelona Brookline, holder of all kinds alcoholic beverage license as a common victualer at 1700 Beacon Street for an increase in outside seating from 36, sorry, um, yeah, from 36 to 84. Were there people here that wanted to speak on this? Well, I guess, is there anyone here who wants to comment on this application? Seeing and hearing none? Okay. So uh, I have the motion to increase the seating from 36 to 84. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Binka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Chair votes aye. Happy seating. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for going in.
and the next one has been withdrawn. So, um, huh? Sorry, have you folks come for cognac? Oh, no cognac. Oh dear, I announced earlier that they've withdrawn their application. So we, we don't know if it will come to us again, but this is, previously this was a continuation of a hearing that was begun earlier, and they have withdrawn the application, so if they want to make any applications, they have to start all over again. Okay? So... I, I don't know the answer to that. We've been, uh, we, we understand that the restaurant may be up for sale, but it's also operating at this time as far as I know. I'm sorry, you really have to come over to the microphone if you want to talk. The, the, the answer is the we, owner, we don't know. We, 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 we understand that it has been offered for sale, but the management has not changed. The management is still the same management. All right? We don't know. It's still managed by the same Mr. Mr. Cognac is the manager owner and there is no change as of this time. Okay. Finally, we have a couple of warrant article items. Um, first being nine, sorry, 19, 20, and 21. And those articles are um, before us with a uh, memorandum of agreement in connection with them. And I just want to be sure that everybody has all of the documents that you need in order for us to discuss these. I don't think there's much uh, that we don't know, but let's make sure we've got all of our documents in hand. Um, because the So you should have the final version of the memorandum of agreement with all of the changes in it. And there should be an attachment with a recalculation from the assessor. Everybody got that? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So we know what we're dealing with here. Yes. Um, are there any comments from members of the board or questions before we go forward and there's town council just in time yeah. I think we're pretty clear about where we are but I don't want to move these unless um, we're all fully up to speed sure Jennifer Gilbert town council the memorandum of agreement uh, is intended to be incorporated into the several votes under Articles 19, 20, and 21. The Memorandum of Agreement outlines um, some basic uh, terms with respect to both the escrow agreement uh, that is yet to be negotiated, as well as the air rights lease, um, the price for the release of easement, as well as the grant of the um, partial easement and the air rights lease are incorporated into the MOA and were determined by our um, <clears throat> Chief Assessor Gary McCabe. And so uh, state law requires that with respect to these type of property interests, a price, a minimum price be set and incorporated as well into the vote at town meeting. Um, this document will be binding and will be recorded. It has provisions with respect to zoning relief and the Dover Amendment. With respect to the escrow agreement, that remain, remains to be negotiated, but it will contain provisions with respect to the building permit uh, being specific as to a third theater space with a minimum of, of 125 seats. 
must preserve the um, current Art Deco details that they've been working on over the past decade or so. It requires a design advisory team review, regardless of uh, whether or not they qualify for Dover relief, and they've agreed to that. It requires a parking lot redesign plan. It requires a significant review of the parking and loading areas in the back uh, to determine whether they're um, to make sure there are no significant impacts on the other uses in the area. With respect to the air rights lease, there'll be two tiers. One um, that considers the nonprofit current theater use and will also take into consideration any change in use or in the uh, nonprofit status. In other words, if it were to change in a decade or, or more down the road to a for-profit or a different use, there'd be a second tier in the air rights lease agreement, which also remains to be negotiated. And that has to be approved by the state legislature because we're looking at a 99-year lease. Currently, town meeting has authorization only up to 30-year uh, leases, so we will be seeking uh, home rule authorization at the state legislature for that. And then again, as I said, the price it will be incorporated um, if zoning relief is granted, any piece of it, whether it's for a loading area or other piece of it uh, under Dover, and they do qualify for Dover, what we've put in there is that the board has the last and sort of final say on release of the escrow, release of all the land disposition documents to make this deal happen. Um, so that is sort of a belt and suspenders approach. Um, and. The moderator wants this uh, to be sent out with the supplemental mailing on the 23rd, so should the board approve it, I'll make sure to get the theater, it's not only the theater signature, but also Hamilton Corporation, which is the actual owner of the property. So that all three parties' signature will get it out to the town meeting members so they have the final version. Any questions for town council? Yes, Selectman Daly. Um, I think the, the price you're referring to has to do with the exchange of easements uh, between us and them, but um, some of that um, could also be offset by public benefits, could That's it not? exactly right. So the provision that we have um, speaks to that. We have to set the price, and what we, what we say is that that can, the value can be determined by including the public benefits that the that the uh, theater provides. For example, use of the uh, large theater room for public events, that certainly has a value to the town. Um, they are considering uh, spending uh, their own money on redoing and redesigning and paving and curbing and other issues in the back parking lot that the town would have had to otherwise pay for. They also have a payment in lieu of taxes agreement that, um, that could be also can be considered as an offset. Uh, because they're not required to pay taxes as a nonprofit, but they've agreed to enter into a pilot agreement and continue on with that, with that pilot agreement. So you're actually right, and that's contained um, in paragraph five of the MOA. And I'll just point out that we have a, an updated uh, valuation from the uh, assessor. Right, attached. that's attached to the MOA right. and uh, with a memorandum, and then also a chart. Um, with respect to the extinguishment of the easement, the indicated value is 148,800, and then you would you would um, then also take into consideration the value coming back to the town. They're actually granting the town an easement on the corner in the back, which our town engineer Peter Peter Ditto wanted to keep because that makes the travel from that corner piece um, much easier, and that's valued at 38,170. So that's a value coming back to the town. And then you have, um, with respect to the air rights, we have several values because right now we believe it to be a one story, um, but we, I wanted to make sure that the values for a two or a three story were in there depending on how much height they're gonna be using there because there's a significant amount of height, uh, 70 feet I believe as of right. Uh, so we have several values there based on a one story building, a two story and a three story for the 950 square feet that's the air rights piece, and um, if you look at the value for those, it's 58,126 um, for the one story, 132,226 for a two, and then 214,876. Um, now, those are sales values, but if you were to look at the memo, if you were to do an annual 
um, air rights lease, the year one rental rate for a one story just on the air rights is only 2325 So you have to read the um, memo along with the chart. And then it, then it all right. makes sense. It's very complicated, but it does make sense. <laughs> uh, questions? Other questions for town council? It's like when Benka, you've taken out your warrant book as if you <laughs> wanted to check language. No, well, I, um, I, I was just uh, wondering uh, precisely what the terms of the vote would be. And I was just looking, and the advisory committee has voted uh, a favorable action subject to the memorandum of agreement, and that language is already in the advisory committee vote. It is. Uh, it refers to a draft memorandum, but I'm... Yes, that's correct. Um, I think... Um, the well, goal we've listed a vote on the memorandum of agreement, and maybe that would be the first vote we want to take, and then right. vote each of the warrant articles. Right. Yeah, that's, that's right. what I had Right, but you should, you should I, I would Sorry. suggest mirroring the vote to make sure your votes of approval on the articles are conditional on this this final MOA. Sure, but yeah. don't we need to vote the memo, f the MOA first? Yes. Yeah, okay, yes, so yes. we should vote the MOA and then vote each article um, with the uh, MOA as a condition for favorable action? Yeah, I think you can, I yeah. think if Dick has the, the yeah, uh, let, you want to tell us a vote? Well, let, let me, I, I agree, I think we would vote the memorandum of agreement and let me just read the language that's in for yes, example, please. Thank you. It says, Article 19, this is the advisory committee's vote. The last paragraph says, Article 19 is approved subject to terms and conditions substantially as set forth in a draft memorandum of agreement by and among the Coolidge Corner Theater Foundation, the Hamilton Charitable Corporation, and the Town of Brookline, which memorandum shall accompany and be made a part of this vote. Now, with our vote today, we are beyond a draft right, so you memorandum. Want, right. So it's the final as presented to you this evening. So it would um, you could vote that language and just take out the word draft. We would just take out uh, take out the word draft right. in our vote. Right. Good. Okay. Um, I guess I want to be very careful about this. Are we approving, adopting? How would the um, language? So the vote, vote, on, the vote the on the memorandum of agreement is, is to approve to the memorandum of agreement as presented by town council right. this evening. Approve is approve the word I'm looking for. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to move that we approve the memorandum of agreement presented to us on Tuesday, May 21st, in connection with the um, articles 19, 20, and 21 of the annual town meeting. And you should have um, two, two final versions with the exhibit attached for your signature. Right, right. All in favor of approving the memorandum of agreement, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Benka? Aye. Selectman Goldstein? Aye. Selectman Wyshynski? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Now, um, I'm going to move favorable action on Article 19, and perhaps Mr. Benka um, yeah, if you'd I, read that out and then we'll... <laughs> I would, well, it's, it's quite a long vote. Um, it's, this is the vote that the town vote to extinguish, abandon, or otherwise release a portion of the easement. And the vote goes on giving the description of the easement by meets and bounds. So I, I think you, you can. I would recommend that we um, accept, that, that we um, uh, vote favorable action on the vote as, of the advisory committee with the as proposed by the advisory committee with the deletion of the word draft in the final paragraph. Can you say the, the pages in the combined uh, reports? Yes, on pages 19-5 to 19-6 of the combined reports. So can, so can you read the operative sentence? That yes. Has the word, yeah, read, read that. Without, without the word draft? Correct. It will be Article 19 is approved subject to terms and conditions substantially as set forth in a memorandum of agreement by and among the Coolidge Corner Theater Foundation, the Hamilton Charitable Corporation, and the town of Brookline, which memorandum shall accompany and be made part of this vote. Okay, so did you get that, Kate? All right. S that, then the motion is favorable action, and I'm not going to even try to repeat. 
All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Chair votes aye. Okay, now we get to Article 20, which has, as, uh, as uh, recommended by the advisory committee, it says Article 20 is approved, a similar language, and then it says the memorandum of agreement referred to in the above motion is set forth on pages 19-7 to 1914 of these reports. So I would recommend that we take out that last sentence and take out the word draft. Yes. Okay. So All right. the last... Kate, did you, did you, you got it? Okay. I, I would um, recommend, I move favorable action on, on Article 20. Article 20, as voted by the advisory committee, with the final paragraph to delete the word draft and to delete the final sentence, so that the final paragraph will read, Article 20 is approved, subject to terms and conditions, substantially as set forth in a memorandum of agreement by and among the Coolidge Corner Theater Foundation the Hamilton Charitable Corporation, and the town of Brookline. Oh, wait. It shouldn't say substantially. It just yeah. is what it is. Okay. Um, and then actually, well, we then, we, then we, we have to fix, the fix the, we'll take, out yeah, take the language the from the prior one. vote. Yeah, That's right. what you okay, want. Okay, so let me move to reconsider but the prior vote. that language is in the prior vote. Yes, it is. Yes, yeah, so we're going to take it out now. We're going to reconsider the prior the vote. The word substantially. You don't need the word substantially. You're voting right. it right. favorable action. It was in the first vote. Yeah. We're, so what, let, me move to recon, let me move to reconsider. We don't need that in there. Let me right. move to reconsider our vote on Article 19. All in favor, please aye. say aye. Aye. <laughs> aye. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Now let me move Article 19 as we previously voted it and without the word substantially. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. aye. And chair votes aye. Okay. Now let me. Back All to Article right. 20. The final paragraph of Article 20 would read, Article 20 is approved, subject to terms and conditions as set forth in a memorandum of agreement by and among the Coolidge Corner Theater Foundation, the Hamilton Charitable Corporation, and the town of Brookline. And I would add, which memorandum shall accompany and be made a part of this vote? That's right. Yes. Perfect. Got that, Kate? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Binka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Chair votes aye. Finally. Okay. Um, on Article, Article 21. Article um, The We have a similar uh, language in the advisory committee vote. Um, uh, as um, we had in Article 20. So let me move Article 21 uh, in the language voted by the advisory committee uh, with a change in the final paragraph to read as follows. Article 21 is approved, subject to terms and conditions as set forth in a memorandum of agreement by and among the Coolidge Corner Theater Foundation, the Hamilton Charitable Corporation, and the town of Brookline, which memorandum shall accompany and be made a part of this vote? Correct. All in Thank favor, you. please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Kate, I sure hope you <laughs> got it all. So, all right. Last item on our agenda is possible reconsideration of Article 2, Collective Bargaining. I will move reconsideration of Article 2. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. And chair votes aye. Mr. Bow, uh, we have two collective bargaining agreements, I believe. That is correct. Sandra DeBow, Human Resources Director. Uh, since I last appeared before you, we have two additional uh, collective bargaining agreements that have um, 
been ratified, and um, they <clears throat> one is with the AFSME bargaining unit for the library. It is pretty much in step with the main um, contract that was settled in April um, with a duration of July 1st, 2012 um, and expiring on June 30th, 2015 with uh, two percent increases in each of the fiscal years. Um, under this agreement, uh, we will be moving all the AFSCME members to electronic pay advisories as we did with the main contract. Um, we have uh, come to agreement on new paraprofessionals um, hired after July 1st, uh, 2013, will now have a different vacation allotment than those previously, which results in them having um, earning no more than four weeks in a calendar year um, beginning in their 15th year. We also made an adjustment to the longevity um, pay schedule. They were seeking for an overall adjustment, but they were concerned that they wanted a greater adjustment at the top, the top two tiers. Um, and so we made adjustments um, of $25 in the lower two tiers and $200 um, for each of the higher tiers. With regard to um, this collective bargaining uh, group, they also had an increase in their night differential. They have a night differential for the night shifts, and it was an increase by two dollars to eleven dollars per shift. And the contract um, going forward will be a six point three percent increase. Okay, questions for over Ms. three years. Over three yeah, years, right? Any, any question? Oh, and, and this has been ratified by the um, library um, employees. That is correct. Right. Any questions for Ms. Debo? Then I just have a brief comment. Quick. Uh, I want to compliment you on moving ahead so uh, expeditiously to get some of these done. I also want to say, given that um, our last round of contracts were very low numbers, including I think we had a zero in all yes. of them. And so this is um, not out of line, I think. Uh, right, we thought it was appropriate. Mm -hmm. All right, I move that we approve the uh, collective bargaining agreement with local 1358 uh, American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Council 93, AFL CIO. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Benka? Aye. Selectman Goldstein? Aye. Selectman Wyshynski? Aye. Chair votes aye. Uh, engineering? Yes, with regard to the engineers, they also um, had a contract for the same term um, from July 1st, 2012 to June 30th, 2015, with the same um, two, two, and two increases um, in each fiscal year. Uh, we had done some work with them in 2009. We did a classification study um, that looked at uh, engineers in similar other uh, agencies and municipalities. Um, we agreed within the confines of this contract that there needed to be some adjustments in within their pay scales, which we uh, agreed to. And they being the engineer and math wizards that they are, were able to come up with a method that um, the over, they would see an overall change in the pay grade, but they were actually taking steps backwards so that it would not impact the budget as much. So they were going back in steps, but still making um, more money per hour. Um, and on top of that, getting the 2%. Um, in order to come within the framework that we were asking them to with regard to wages, though. They did agree to take a reduction in their longevity at $125 um, per gate in the first two gates, which is significant because that's where the majority of all their current employees are in those first two gates. So um, with all that good work, um, it comes to 6.2 over the course of the three-year contract. <laughs> And this contract has also been ratified by the Brookline Engineering Division. Unanimously, yes. Okay. Questions, comments for Mr. Bow? 
Then I move that we approve the Brookline Engineering Division Associates Collective Bargaining Agreement. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Binka? Aye. Selectman Goldstein? Aye. Selectman Wyshynski? Aye. Chair votes aye. And finally, I move favorable action on Article 2, Collective Bargaining. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Benka? Aye. Selectman Goldstein? Aye. Selectman Wyshynski? Aye. Chair votes aye. And then finally, uh, Article 10, do we have a motion to reconsider? I'll, I'll move for reconsideration. All in favor of reconsideration under Article 10, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Benka? Aye. Selectman Goldstein? Aye. Selectman Wyshynski? Aye. Chair votes aye. And what would we like to do under reconsideration? I, I'm, I'm going to say, first of all, I, I think uh, Mr. Ames actually um, was correct when he said that they've made some substantial changes and, and uh, tried to address some of our concerns. I, s I still have a number of concerns and feel that the language still leaves um, uh, potentially a lot of um, stepping on toes between human relations and human resources. And um, I think um, I, I, I also, uh, you know, I notice, I, I think that I would still recommend that it be referred to our diversity committee to. Um, really get this right. Uh, e even in their write-up in the, the uh, combined reports, they mentioned what an extensive process had gone into the human relations bylaw initially. And I think that um, we will certainly, we've had our first meeting, we will try to move very expeditiously, but I think this does deserve um, some attention to get this, to get this right. Okay. In the, uh, in the advisory committee's vote on this, they made specific re reference to the governor's executive, executive order 526, and uh, I, I think, I, I don't believe our vote has that yet. And, uh, so I have you no amend. problem with, um, uh, did they, did they um, have, is it, it's, it's part of the referral. It's part vote. of the referral, okay. but, it be, it's, but it, yeah. it, it refers it with, uh, mm -hmm. Okay. A, uh, I'm sorry, should have been better prepared. With request uh, yeah. that in, consultants, in consultation with the Selectmen's Committee, that the, uh, that the, um, I'm sorry, that the Board of Selectmen formulate an equal, op uh, equal employment opportunity affirmative action policy for the town, taking into consideration as appropriate, and there's debate over whether should, there should be a comma after appropriate or not, uh, as, and I believe this should be, as appropriate, Governor of Deval Patrick's Executive Order 526, the underlying ap applicable state and federal law, and the December 11, 2012 Human Resources Board Equal op Employment Opportunity Policy. So I think that's, uh, those are uh, worthy, uh, worthy directions, and, um, and I would move that we uh, amend our previous vote to include that. Okay, I, I think there should be a comma before and after as appropriate. Uh, Two commas. Into, yes, I agree with you. Taking into consideration, comma, as appropriate, comma. Mm -hmm. I, I only mentioned it. I have it no, no problem mentioned. with that. The, this is certainly a topic that was on my list to the committee uh, to um, look at. We have a draft version from uh, the Human Relations I believe the diversity subcommittee, although maybe that has been voted by the whole Human Relations Commission, I'm not sure. And we have another draft version from our Human Resources Board and um, certainly have uh, Executive Order 526 to look at, but I think we may be able to look at um, policies from a few other venues as well to try to come up with you know, the best option. Um. I'm going to add one little grammatical thing because I, I've read the note and now I understand why. Um, I think what was um, intended and the reason there were no commas uh, is that it was suggesting that as appropriate because there are aspects of the executive order that would not apply to municipalities. Um, that you might want it to say, comma, as appropriate, comma, Governor Patrick's execu executive order and the underlying, et cetera. Do you read that? 
<laughs> I'm, I'm really wondering whether uh, putting in the commas or not putting in the commas and the and uh, is really uh, well, I just figured out about the commas. That's worth all. the effort, uh, and is such that the advisory committee then has to go back and look at their vote again. The, the, this is Take a referral motion. Out. It's a referral yeah, motion. Right. Yes. Yeah. Well, Take what, the commas what out. What was the okay. omission of the Fine. comma significant? You think? Uh, I thought it was well, just. A, I thought it was just an oversight myself. Uh, I, I don't think it changes the meaning. I mean, there's. I just thought gr grammatically. No, no, I agree with you. I, it should I, have commas. I didn't, I didn't realize yeah. that somebody meant some meaning behind. Yeah. <laughs> omitting that comma. But. I mean, no, I, okay, I, I'm, I'm not going to argue over the commas. <laughs> All right, I would, fine. I would move favorable action in the uh, words of the advisory committee. Without okay. commas. Without commas, without, okay. without a change. <laughs> and, unless, unless somebody can point out a significant substantive impact of that, and I don't see that. Well, I just, I thought, I thought that this was, re the note there and everything was that you might, Yeah, you're, you're understanding what I just clicked on, but that's okay. It doesn't I matter. It, I think it reads better with the commas, to be honest. I think it does, too. Of course it does. It's You should have commas. But I, I don't think there's okay. any substantive <laughs> meaning difference either. But I mean, it could be read without the commas to say that it's making a statement that Executive Order 526 is appropriate. But I don't actually have no, any problem with that. Yeah. Okay, now I don't have I, okay, an, I don't really have a problem with that if you want it because I think now it is. I see what uh, you're saying. It okay. is certainly it's certainly applicable. And um, well, I'll go along with the commas. Okay, then. all right. I, <laughs> all right. Well, I so move then uh, with the commas. Okay. All right. <laughs> I think we've solved our grammatical problem. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Chair votes aye. And I'm getting comatose here. Right? All right. I think we are somewhat comatose. But that ends the Board of Selectmen's meeting for Tuesday, May 21st. So now, bad news.